Chair Weeks, we're good to start on time whenever you're ready. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to call to order the, what day is this? No. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to call to order the April 27th, 2023 meeting of the Planning Commission. And um, if you could please take roll. Commissioner Carter? Here. Commissioner Cisco? Here. Commissioner Holton is absent. Um, and just an FYI, he was supposed to remote in, but he can no longer, no longer participate in this meeting. So the information at the top of the agenda is not needed. Um, Commissioner Duggan? Here. Commissioner Sanders? Present. Vice Chair Peterson? Here. Chair Weeks? Here. Thank you. Um, and as the recording secretary indicated, Commissioner Holton will not be here tonight. Um, so with that, uh, we go on to approval of minutes and we don't have any minutes tonight. So we'll go to public comment on non agenda items. This is a time when any person may address the commission on matters that are not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the commission. And if you are in person and want to make a public comment, uh, please go to one of the podiums at the top and you will be unmuted. And please state your name for the record. But you know the drill, don't you, Mr. DeWitt? Are you ready? Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group. Earlier this week, we put forward a flyer that we sent in to you folks, and we hope you've had a chance to read it, about seniors and veterans extended stay suites. Hopefully you looked at the idea and the proposal. It's something that's a successful business model throughout the United States. It's been going on for at least a quarter of a century where they build these extended stay suites Holiday Inn Extended Stay Suites, uh, Extended Stay America, things of that nature. Here locally, we've had two housing uh, short-term rental type of things, what are known as hotels in the past, that were built very quickly. One is the AC Hotel over here in Railroad Square, and the other is La Quinta down on Santa Rosa Avenue. The reason this was put forward to you is to point out that if you were to build housing on a commercial model, you could get it in much faster than if you tried to do it under your typical approach of affordable housing, sometimes taking up to a decade to a dozen years for the Lantana Project in southwest Santa Rosa and in other areas they've taken that long. So you'll say, well, we don't have a project before us. Well, part of the idea is you have a department that's paid for with taxpayers' money called the Advanced Planning Department. And you folks could give them direction to say, how could we work with the commercial community to get these types of housing projects in quickly here closer to the center of town and have them be multi-story just down the street. Now you've got Mr. Futrell's project, seven stories. You can get these taller projects in with prefabricated modular building techniques and they can be done within my lifetime. Affordable housing is taking far so long for so many of these people, seniors and veterans are losing out on the chance. Some of them are actually having to lose their house and then they end out on the street and maybe going homeless. So there's a multi-million dollar homeless industry, obviously, to help those folks get something going. Caritas over here is recently being built, tens of millions of dollars going forward on land that was formerly owned by the city of Santa Rosa Redevelopment Agency. Downtown here we have a project area that was called the White House when I was younger. You did a study on it over 15 years ago pointing out that housing could be built there, multi-story, that's the way to go perhaps. The unfortunate dilemma is that we're not having a coordinated and collaborative approach to get these things done. It has to start with, I believe, you, the appointed bureaucrats, the paid bureaucrats, and then our elected officials saying, yes, we're actually going to put in good, efficient, 
affordable housing downtown Santa Rosa. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Anybody else who would like to speak on items that are not on the agenda? Uh, see no one in the chamber. Do we have anybody on Zoom with their hand raised? Just a reminder, if you're participating via Zoom and if you'd like to make a public comment, you can raise your hand by selecting the raised hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're calling in, please press star nine. Chair Weeks, we don't have any hands raised in Zoom. Thank you. So with that, I'll go ahead and close this public comment period and um, we'll move on. Um, so as we do at every meeting, I'll state this, our statement of purpose. The Planning Commission is charged with carrying out the California planning and zoning laws in the city of Santa Rosa. Duties include implementing of plans, ordinances, and policies relating to land use matters, assisting in writing and implementing the general plan and area plans, holding public hearings, and acting on proposed changes to the zoning code, zoning map, general plan, tentative map, tentative subdivision maps, and undertaking special planning studies as needed. And then we'll move on to commissioner reports, uh, item 4.2. Are there any reports? Okay, uh, then we'll move on to item five, department report. Yes, thank you, Chair Weeks and members of the commission, Jessica Jones, uh, Deputy Director for Planning. Um, the only thing I have for you tonight is just to um, let everybody know that at the last city council meeting, the mayor did um, identify that she will be reappointing uh, Chair Weeks um, to continue with her position as chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, and so we will be adding an item to our agenda for the next meeting, which is May 11th, um, for appointment um, of a vice chair. That's it. Thank you. So um, are there any abstentions tonight? Okay, seeing none, um, we have no consent items, so we'll move on to our first scheduled item tonight. Uh, and it is item 8.1, it's a public hearing, Lazini's Market, Type 21 Off-Sale ABC License. It is an exempt project for a conditional use permit at 3449 Bennett Valley Road, CUP 22-074. And this is an ex parte item, so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Commissioner Cisco. Um, I visited the site and I have no new information to disclose. Thank you. Vice Chair Peterson. I also visited the site and have no new information to disclose. Thank you. Commissioner Duggan. I visited the site and have no new information to disclose. Thank you. Commissioner Carter. I have no information to disclose. Thank you. Commissioner Sanders. I visited the site and have nothing to disclose. Thank you. And I also visited the site and have nothing further to disclose. So with that, um, our planner tonight on this is Mike Janusak. And is he via Zoom? He is via Zoom, okay. yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Weeks. Uh, may I go ahead and, and start presenting? Yes, go ahead, Mike. Okay. Okay, can you all see my title slide? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Janusak. I'm a contract planner with M Group, and I'll be presenting the conditional use permit um, staff report for Lazini's Market. This is for alcohol sales um, at 3449 Bennett Valley Road, and it is file number CP22-074. Uh, before I jump into my presentation, I'd like to summarize uh, an update to my slides that um, all commissioners should have received earlier this afternoon. Um, and that includes slide two. Uh, I edited the project description uh, to clarify that the, the project description includes a change of, of license. Slide five, I removed placeholder text 
um, and updated the project history to reflect the staff report. Slide seven, I uh, changed out the map to provide um, more current crime data as reflected in the staff report. Slide nine, I removed placeholder text and um, consistent with the staff report, I showed that uh, no public comments were received. And lastly, slide 10, I added a slide um, where I will go into staff's analysis of applicable findings. So um, that's, uh, that's most of my slides. So hopefully that also serves to give you an overview of my presentation for, for this afternoon. Um, the project description is a, a conditional use permit to change the existing ABC license to include the additional sale of distilled spirits for offset consumption at the existing market. Uh, there you see Lazini's in the picture. Um, and a conditional use permit is required uh, by zoning code section 20-42034 uh, for markets with a floor area of less than 10,000 square feet that propose to sell alcohol. Um, and this is essentially a change from a type 20 to a type 21, which, uh, and what that means is their type 20 is um, beer and wine offsite consumption and a type 21 is general offsite consumption. And so um, that would include distilled spirits. Uh, the applicant's narrative provided in attachment three gives um, some owner and operator history um, the applicant currently uh, has operated there since uh, 2021 and um, staff uh, communicated with ABC to verify that a valid type 20 license has been at this location since 1992. Um, that original type 20 license is in, was in existence from 92 to 98 and after which um, any subsequent uh, change in ownership, there was a transfer, person to person transfer. Um, and so all that is to say, there's no record of the CUP for that type 20, uh, type 20 license in, in the city of Santa Rosa. Um, and we did a bit more digging as staff and there's uh, an annexation map that shows this site was annexed in 1996. And so um, with a good amount of certainty, we can say that um, the store has um, sold alcohol um, legally, um, predating annexation, and also predating the, um, the CUP process uh, required by Santa Rosa. Uh, here you see a vicinity map. It's a corner lot in an existing residential neighborhood. Um, to the south, the city limit is shown in pink, and beyond that um, are low-density hillside um, residences that are in unincorporated Sonoma County. Um, the zoning and land use. The zoning is a neighborhood commercial, which allows small-scale um, commercial within residential neighborhoods to serve nearby residences. And then you'll notice there is some uh, designation outside of the city limits and that's because it's the, uh, showing the land use that it, the areas the county areas within the uh, the planning area for the general plan but it, it does not have um, city zoning and then uh, abutting the uh, directly abutting we've got r16 on the west and rural residential 40 um, to the north and then there's a a planned district um, to the east. All of it is uh, low density residential uh, within the city. Uh, project history, it was, uh, the application was submitted in November of last year. Uh, the application was deemed complete in December of last year and the notice for this hearing was distributed um, 10 days prior to today on April 27th. Um, I do want to uh, point out that there's a there was a noticing def defect um, not for this the hearing itself but um, as part of the review timeline um, section 20-50050e requires a notice of application is sent uh, 45 days after project submittal um, is received that did not occur 
um, however, pursuant to um, zoning code section 20-66-020A3, um, um, a defect in the notice procedure does not affect the review authority's ability to take action on a matter unless otherwise provided by law. Um, because the notice application was not state mandated and because staff has not identified any major concerns um, that would necessitate additional noticing, um, staff is comfortable bringing this item forward uh, to the commission this afternoon. Here's the floor plan. Uh, there are no uh, physical improvements proposed interior or exterior. Uh, however, uh, they are showing an, uh, within the existing storage uh, area where they would have the addition of distilled spirits stored. And then um, there'll be sort of, you can see my cursor. This is where the storage area will be um, rearranged. And then there'll be some new shelving behind the checkout counter that will include um, distilled spirits. But there's nothing that's requiring uh, permitting um, from a, a physical standpoint. Um, here is a crime density map that shows it's in a low crime area. The application was referred to uh, the police department who had no uh, comments or concerns on the application. Um, we uh, planning staff reviewed crime data uh, over the past two years and there were uh, two DUI related arrests made at the property. Here is a map showing a thousand foot buffer from the site. And uh, Ulupa Elementary is about 1500 feet away. There's no schools, daycares or parks um, within a thousand feet. And um, I won't show you the other maps from the staff report that include daycares and parks. Those are uh, farther beyond um, the school. No public comments were received. Um, and um, staff is able to make the applicable findings. Uh, you'll see them in the staff report. I've noted where those are located um, with respect to each applicable um, set of criteria. Um, I try to incorporate the more pertinent um, aspects of the findings in, in the, the previous slides, but I'll summarize uh, here. The general plan policies um, can be met uh, the application is consistent with the general plan, particularly where uh, neighborhood grocery stores can be supported within walking areas of uh, residential areas. Um, per ABC, the, the change in ABC license will not result in an increase in ABC licenses, and the census tract does not currently exhibit an undue number of licenses. Um, a PC or N is not required. Um, the applicant has indicated uh, surveillance cameras are located at the business and the applicant is also um, is not requesting a waiver of any operational standards pursuant to section uh, 2042034B. Um, condition, number, condition number four in your res draft resolution also um, requires the applicant to comply with all applicable operating standards. Um, the proposed use is an Existing commercial building and no physical improvements are proposed. The market has been in operation within the existing residential neighborhood, including the sale of beer and wine for approximately 31 years. Staff is not aware of um, any issues related to offsite wine and beer sales at this location. And in addition, the Santa Rosa Police Department um, has expressed no comments or conditions uh, regarding the proposed use of this location. Um, the project is um, has been reviewed and is eligible for a class one um, existing facilities exemption under CEQA, um, which allows for interior and exterior alterations involving such things as partitions, plumbing, electrical conveyances uh, with no or negligible expansion of the use. Um, as previously stated, there's no interior exterior improvements that would require permitting and there will be um, a negligible expansion of alcohol sales. And, uh, the Planning and Economic Development Department recommends that the Planning Commission by resolution approve 
a conditional use permit to allow the sale of alcohol for offsite consumption um, from the existing commercial building located at 3449 Bennett Valley Road. Um, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to um, answer any questions that commissioners may have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does the applicant have a presentation or are they available if there are questions? I, I believe they are in attendance in person. Um, yes, they are. I, I don't. Just, okay. Um, do you know if they have an, a presentation or just to answer a questions? I don't believe they have a formal presentation, okay. but um, they may want, wish to speak or be available for questions. Okay. Um, do you wish to make any comments at this point as the applicant? Okay. Thank you. So are there any questions um, of staff before I open the public hearing on this? Commissioner Sanders? Does, in either case, uh, the license, ABC license 20 or 21, does that allow people to drink at the little cool tables that you guys got outside? No. So either way. Okay. Thanks. Th thank you. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and um, open the public hearing on this item. And um, if you wish to make a comment, please go to the podium at the top. You'll have three minutes and you will be given a countdown timer and be unmuted. Okay, I don't see anybody going. So is there anybody on Zoom with their hands raised? As a reminder, if you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand by selecting the raised hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you're calling in, press star nine. Chair Weeks, I don't see any hands raised. Thank you. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing on this and bring it back to the commission. Um, would somebody like to make a motion on this resolution? Commissioner Duggan. I will move a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa making findings and determinations and approving a conditional use permit to allow the sale of alcohol for off-site consumption at the existing commercial building located at 3449 Bennett Valley Road, APN number 049-260-013, file number CUP22-074 and waive for the reading. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Sanders seconded. So with that, we'll go ahead and start with comments. Um, let's go ahead and start with Commissioner Duggan. Um, I am in support of the um, request. I went, visited the market today. It's very tidy and nice, and they have beer and wine for sale already, and I think this just um, will add a little bit to that. Obviously, it's just changing it for distilled spirits, and I am fully supportive. I can make all the required findings. Thank you. Commissioner Carter. I'm also familiar with the site and its operations. Um, I see no reason to object to this slight expansion in their offerings and I can make all the required findings and we'll be supporting the project. Thank you. Commissioner Sanders. I can also make all the uh, required findings and I'll support the project. Thank you. Commissioner Sisko. Uh, yes, I can also make all of the required findings. Um, I think one of the benefits to the city in this application is that there will be a conditional use permit uh, approved for this. And just as a piece of history, um, many years ago uh, when Mike Casey, uh, city attorney, was here with the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, he put forward um, a deemed approved ordinance to give neighborhoods a mechanism uh, if there were uh, issues with alcohol sales on these sites that did not, you know, that pre predated uh, a, con a conditional use permit. And so that's been in place for many years, but I think it's also, it's just better to have the more <laughs> common and familiar thing. Not that you'd ever have a complaint. You, you obviously run a very well run operation, but just wanna, I'm glad we're getting a conditional use permit. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Peterson. Uh, I can also make all the required findings and am in support of this change. 
Thank you. And I also can make all the required findings. Um, I think it is a good addition to what you already have there. And I can make all the required findings. Uh, so with that, um, it was moved by Commissioner Duggan, seconded by Commissioner Sanders. If we could go ahead and have the vote, please. Commissioner Carter. Aye. Commissioner Sisko. Aye. Commissioner Duggan. Aye. Commissioner Sanders. Aye. Vice Chair Peterson? Aye. Chair Weeks? Aye. So that passes with six ayes, one uh, absent, um, that being Commissioner Holton. And I do want to note that this action is final unless an appeal is filed with the city clerk's office within 10 calendar days of today's decision pursuant to zoning code section 20-62.030. And with that, that includes that item. We're going to pause for just a few minutes while we get some technical assistance up here. Okay, thank you all um, for that. Days of modern technologies. <laughs> um, so with that, I will go ahead and uh, introduce item 8.2. It's a public hearing on short-term rentals ordinance amendments. And uh, Deputy Director Jones. Thank you, thank Chair you. Weeks, members of the commission. Um, yes, uh, Jessica. I'm, we're having some feedback here. Uh, Jessica Jones, uh, Deputy Director for Planning. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, introduce this item before um, Ms. Meads uh, gives you a, a formal presentation. Um, as you know, this is the first time that the Planning Commission uh, has heard this item. Um, so uh, Sherry's gonna be going over all the details of the project, giving you history, um, going over the existing ordinance uh, and the proposed changes, as well as uh, the outreach that has been done uh, since the 
original ordinance was adopted, um, but just wanted to uh, make sure the commission and the public is aware that this has been a very collaborative uh, team approach um, to putting this uh, recommendation together amongst city staff. Um, we've been working with all of the divisions and departments within the city uh, to bring forward uh, what's in front of you today, um, and as well as meeting with community members, um, community groups, as well as individuals, um, both in support of and uh, in opposition of short-term rentals. Um, so Sherry, again, is gonna be going all, over all this in detail, but I just wanted to give that quick intro, um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Sherry for the full presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Weeks and members of the commission. I'm going to share my screen. Can you put the microphone a little closer to you if possible? I don't, probably, I don't know if it's... I don't, hope I don't break anything. That, no, I, that's perfect right oh, there. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. There we go. Excuse the technical difficulties, please. There we go. I'm used to doing this from home. I apologize. It's been a while since I've been in the chambers with y'all. So good afternoon. I'm Sherry Meads. I'm a senior planner with the Long Range Planning Team. And as Jessica so kindly kicked off, we're here to talk about short-term rental ordinance amendments. And I'm happy to be before you this evening. Um, just a brief project description. We didn't do a lot of what this is focused on are technical changes. And when we say technical changes, that's reorganizing, that's changing grammar, just anything to try to make the ordinance um, more convenient for our constituents, for our staff, and to um, just help the project, the short-term rental program, run smoothly, enforcement and permitting and the whole shebang. Um, we did add some new definitions and policies, which I'll detail later, and we also discuss the community engagement that we've done before the initial ordinance and since August 20 of August of last year. So. What is a short-term rental? Most of us know by now, but just in case, um, a short-term rental is a rental of a private residence for less than 30 days. If somebody were to rent their house for 30 days or more, they don't need a permit from the city. That is not something that the city regulates. These are strictly talking about uh, rentals of less than 30 days, whether it's the whole house or just part of the house. They're sometimes known as Airbnbs or VRBOs. And as a regulatory background, before October of 2021, we didn't have any regulations specific to short-term rentals, except that our ADU ordinance, which was adopted in, well, an amendment to the ADU ordinance added in January of 2018, included a provision that ADUs could not be used as short-term rentals at all. Um, back before we uh, introduced the short-term rental ordinance, short-term rental operators were still required to register and pay TOT, transient occupancy taxes, and BIA, business improvement area assessments. Other than that, we were, you know, we didn't regulate. We were in a wait and watch and see what would happen. Um, it never rose to a situation in terms of complaints or interest for us to move forward with an ordinance. But as things started becoming more of an issue in terms of getting complaints, um, 
we started a working group in-house talking about it. We went to the Economic Task Force when that was back when we were in the beginning stages of COVID. They are now called the Economic uh, Development Subcommittee. Um, and during that time between August of 2021 and September of 2021, the Economic Development Subcommittee, we visited them two times. We went over what had been happening with um, violations and gave them a slew of options of what they might wanna see in a short-term rental ordinance. And they said, we wanna see it all, um, which wasn't possible with the with a time frame that we were on. So we did do a community engagement survey before acting on this. We did a um, industry focused, if you will, community meeting and did um, as much outreach as we could in such a short period of time. In October of 2021, we brought forward to the commission on an urgency basis, which means as Jessica mentioned, we did not go through the planning commission. Um, a ordinance which added chapter 2048 short-term rentals to the zoning code and that chapter was laid out to provide a um, approval mechanism and regulations and operating standards so that short-term rentals would hopefully not be a threat to um, the community in terms of public health safety and welfare and to reduce nuisance behaviors also we were looking at it as we need to look at this in terms of how is this affecting our housing stock so that's what the original ordinance did in october of 2021 um, despite the regulations we were finding that certain short-term rental non-hosted short-term rental activities primarily were still causing a few issues and we also despite our best efforts as education on how to create a perfect package to submit for short-term rental permits we found that the onslaught of people that applied for short-term rental permits we ended up with a permitting backlog we were very behind um, so we went back to uh, the city council in august of 2022 and at that point we set a cap on the number of non-hosted short-term rentals at 198 and people are like why 198 that was the number of issued non-hosted short-term rental permits as well as all of the non-hosted short-term rental permits that were still in the pipeline that we were hoping all would be approved if all of them had been approved we would have been at that cap of 198. we also clarified some code enforcement uh, policies in that amendment in august and we also by resolution established a, a permit renewal fee so from there as soon as we did that uh, initial August um, amendment, we knew that we were gonna do more community outreach and find out from the community what they really wanted to hear. We had done an abbreviated version of it, like I mentioned before the initial um, ordinance, but now we were really trying to get a feel for what the community was going to say. Um, so, the standards and requirements that were approved between the first ordinance and then also including the August amendments, you can see them up here. Um, it established the permit requirement. As I mentioned, the August amendment um, capped the non-hosted short-term rental permits at 198. Trying to um, prevent over-concentration, uh, the council enacted a 1,000 foot separation between new non-hosted short-term rentals. We established occupancy guidelines, parking requirements, quiet hours, um, fire and life safety requirements, prohibited events and required neighborhood neighbor notification so that if neighbors were um, finding an issue with the short-term rental, they could contact a, lo a required local contact who could hopefully address any of the issues. Um, so let's move on from there. We established code enforcement penalties, which originally were $500 for a first violation, a second violation of a thousand. And then as you can see here, a third violation of $2,000 with the permit revocation. And for those people who hadn't received a permit yet, but they were in the pipeline and system trying to get their permit, the permitting system to get their permit approved, they would lose what was called their operator in good standing status. And 
That was an original term in the ordinance, which allowed for folks who had been paying their TOT and their BIA, and who also were, uh, they complied with the requirement to apply for a short-term rental by December 3rd, 2021. Um, those were called operators in good standing, and they didn't have to um, uh, comply with the 1,000 foot between them. So if somebody were to have gotten to that third violation with one year, they would have lost that operator in good standing status. So now we're going to talk about, um, did I miss my map? I went too far. How do I go back? There, and I just wanted to show the uh, commissioners and, and anyone in the audience that's participating. This is a, a map that was, um, the data is from probably two weeks ago, because we have to have everything submitted at a certain time before our meetings. And so that shows you where non-hosted short-term rentals are throughout the city. And there are certainly, as you can see, some areas where they're um, closer together and that type of thing. The circles around the dots indicate the 1,000 foot separation requirement. And you can see this information if anybody can visit the site. If you go to srcity.org slash pwmaps slash permit search, or you can also just go to srcity.org forward slash str and select search str permits. And we actually have a, a, a newer um, vanity email I'm sorry, uh, website for that. So I'm not sure why it's not on there. I apologize. So if anybody wants to write this down, if you don't want to go to the general srcity.org slash str website and select S search str permits, you can go to srcity.org forward slash str search, and that'll take you there. It will default to the non-hosted short-term rental locations, as you see here on the map, or you can click on hosted only, or you can click on all of them. So now let's talk about um, what it is that we're looking at in terms of the new amendments. And we'll just quickly go through, um, I need to pause this because this isn't the right presentation. So can we take a break? I apologize. No problem. So we're going to take a short break.
Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and get restarted. Okay, uh, Chair Weeks, members of the Commission, our apologies. Uh, the presentation that was being shown was the one from the last urgency ordinance that went to the Council. So it was a uh, mistake, and we apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but the PowerPoint version that we had uploaded is the correct one. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Sherry's going to start with um, some background that did not get identified um, when she was first going through it. Great, thank you. Thank you, and I apologize for that. I'm not sure how the mix-up happened. But anyway, so I missed some of the background because I was looking at my notes, but then I was looking at this, and I'm like, something's not right here. So I don't want to um, not include the information about the online community survey that we did. Probably most people in the audience took it, um, is my guess. But that was open from September to December, which is you know quite a long time. We wanted to reach as many folks as we could. And to reach folks that are not you know, comfortable necessarily attending public meetings and community meetings. We did some pop-up events out in the community where we would just show up um, and talk to people about short-term rentals. And we did that at Matote Food Park, um, had some delicious food while we were there. Uh, we did one at the Central Library, Community Lighthouse Church, and also at the Farmer's Market on uh, Farmer's Lane. So that was fun. Um, and we got a lot of interesting feedback from folks that, you know, are not already engaged in the um, short-term rental discussion normally. We did hold two virtual community meetings. Both of them had Spanish translation available, were very well attended. We tried to do breakout rooms that were just anonymously, you know, or they were not, we didn't choose who sat with who. It was just a thing where the admin pushed a button and said, your room eight, seven, six, five, four. We were hoping to get um, people that maybe had differing opinions together as sort of a consensus building situation. Um, we also went before the Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Area Advisory Board meeting. It was held on November 16th. Their normal meeting would have been held the week of Thanksgiving. However, every year when that's the case in November, they reschedule it typically for the week before, which is exactly what they did. Um, and so we just went before them and gave them, you know, a similar thing that what we did to start out with, the background, where we're at, to see if they had any questions or feedback. Um, and they did just ask about the timeline. Other than that, there was no additional feedback. There were no additional questions. So I just wanted to, um, to point that out. We already went through the existing standards and requirements. That's the same. Nothing changed there. Um, so that, thankfully, slide was okay. Same thing with the code enforcement penalties that were originally approved with the um, ordinance adoption in October of 2021. And this is why I noticed I'm like, I, I've got to do something here. So this shows you the, um, the easier uh, URL to find and do a search for non-hosted short-term rentals if you want to keep track of them every day. If you want to see, you could click on the, in the dots on the inside and find out a lot more about that permit. And um, it's really a great tool. We've worked really hard with our IT staff and, and our, you know, everybody, code enforcement, to try to put out the tools so that people are able to see what they need to see when making a decision about um, applying for a short-term rental. So this was another slide that, that wasn't in the other uh, presentation and this is the current permit status when we say current that was two weeks ago again like I said we have to have our packets ready uh, awfully early so I will add that we've approved or issued 168 non-hosted now um, so that pending in plan review is down to 18 and that means we have 186 approved or issued total non-hosted short-term rental permits um, and you can see here the denied, and some folks have asked why was an, a hosted one ever denied? And that was a situation where the um, application was for a non-permitted building, and we tried to work with the applicant. Um, however, they 
they just did not respond to that. So, and the, with the most of the denied with the non-hosted um, have been related to over-concentration. So we are also receiving applications for renewals now that we've been in this, uh, had this program open for a while. And at that point we had 60 renewal. We've probably had a few more since then. So we're working through those as well. And one of the things, these the, the two last stats don't really have anything to do with the permitting status, but I know a lot of people have said they would like to see these removed from residential neighborhoods. And so we wanted to point out that so far, the applications that we've received for non-hosted short-term rentals, um, only four of them are in a non-residential zoning district, and we have one hosted that's in a non-residential zoning district. And then we've heard a lot of people say, well, these don't, you know, there's not a lot of them. We have so many, you know, X number of housing units, how many are short-term rentals? So um, as of 2021, we did have 69,495 residential units. So that does indicate that less than 1% are short-term rentals. Um, so that's just data for, for you guys to consider. Next, we're gonna, I'm just briefly gonna glaze over the current code enforcement status. We have Lou Kirk and Jesse Oswald in the audience. They are the experts on this. So any questions, I will absolutely defer to them. That's what these chairs are for. Um, but you can see here, you can get a little bit of an idea of um, how many you know, STR-related complaints have been received since the beginning of the program, and that's 281. A lot of those have been closed, which is excellent. Um, there are still some open. Open. And you can see that 119 administrative citations have been issued and the assessed penalties uh, add up to $85,000. So again, like I said, Lou and, and Jesse will have any detail to that or other questions you may have and, and we'll get to them after I'm, after I'm done talking at you. So now we're gonna talk about the proposed amendments. And I'm not gonna go into super detail here. Everything's in the packet and the staff report, but I do wanna um, give a, you know, a high level overview and again, can answer any specific questions. I have my red line copy in front of me. Um, and again, I will, I will say that technical changes in, in the way we're using that here and, and always do when we talk about this is when we first did the urgency ordinance, we had things organized a certain way that we thought was, you know, you know, maybe the right thing to do at the time, but through implementation and enforcement, we've realized, wait, these things go to, go together better here or here. And, and so we did quite a bit of that type of thing in this um, amendment package before you. And so the purpose, that hasn't changed. I took out some uh, passive language that drove me nuts after I wrote it, read it again. Um, and same thing with the application of this chapter part. We do uh, specify now an additional uh, thing that was added um, that these requirements apply to the owners, the agents, the contacts, people there, and the daytime guests. So we really want, um, to try to do the best we can to to keep these compatible with their with their neighbors. So then the next section is the definitions and again technical changes there. Uh, you know, I'm sure many of us can say I read something that I wrote at one time and then I wish I could have changed it. Well, this was an opportunity for us to be able to go back and do some of those types of changes. So we did that. There were some terms in there that we realized we didn't mention again in the chapter, so we got rid of those. And then we added new definitions to clarify that the renoticing fee is different from the initial application fee, um, which that's, that's a big deal. We tried to have a renewal process and application fee that is less impactful because most of the review has been done already. That first initial review is, is, is a lot of work we've found. Um, and the renewals, hopefully, we're just checking a few things and, and making sure things are good. Okay, so then um, the requ permit requirements and limits, there are, again, just technical changes and the addition of unit type restrictions. And what that means is we looked at certain types of housing that are particularly uh, used for our vulnerable folks, like senior housing, uh, income restricted, affordable housing, um, single residency occupancy, single res uh, SROs, um, and some other types of housing that we really 
want preserved for what they're what they were intended for. So those are limited. And then another change that we did do is, as I mentioned at some point, um, the ADU ordinance that was amendments to the ADU ordinance that were adopted in. January of 2018 specified, based on state law at the time too, that um, short-term rentals could not be used for less than 30, for, I'm sorry, ADUs could not be used for rentals of less than 30 days. So in the ordinance that was approved October 2021, staff referenced that section of the ADU ordinance. Well, that left a bit of a gray area about, okay, well, what about ADUs before 2018 prior to that being added to our ordinance? So what we've done is we've said no new permits for ADUs, um, which is what the council had intended originally and staff had intended originally, but we are allowing ADUs that have received a permit or the recommendation is to allow them to continue to renew if they meet all the other requirements and you know are able to be renewed. However, if that permit lapses, is denied or whatever, it would not be reissued for that ADU. Um, so that is the, the main difference in the location requirements and permit limits, except for, uh, I'm sorry, not the, not the permit limits. That's a new thing that you see in this packet. We did not previously have a limit on how many short-term rentals a person could own. That is something that the council had expressed interest in um, originally, but it wasn't factored in at that time. As I mentioned, we, we were only able to, to get a certain amount in that would qualify as an urgency ordinance, and that didn't rise to that level. We have heard from the community as well that they feel like people sh there should be a limit um, on how many uh, short-term rental permits someone can own. And so some of the uh, reasoning behind um, this recommendation is that for those people that do own multiple short-term rentals, if we were to um, go with this recommendation of allowing only one non-hosted short-term rental permit, it would allow the opportunity for other people who have written and said, well, we can't, it's not fair to us, we can't even get one non-hosted short-term rental permit, but this person has six or five or three or two. So that's the, the rationale behind that. Um, the initial application section, again, we just did some technical changes to try to make it easier for folks to know exactly what they need to do and have ready when they apply. Um, we removed most of the language related to operators in good standing and new operators because thankfully we are just about done with all of the original permits that could have been operators in good standing or new operators. Now everybody is a new operator. so. That, that doesn't sound like much to y'all, but for planning staff, we are really excited about being able to make that change. Um, duration of short-term rental permit, they've always been valid for one year, um, and they've always expired upon, uh, you know, it, it automatically void upon expiration like other permits, but we wanted to make that very clear. We want people to know that so they're on top of it. They, they apply to um, renew prior to the expiration of their existing permit. Um, and then again, the annual requirement, we just clarify how to do it and what they need to do. Neighbor notification, uh, we clarify that um, the notification and re-notification requirements, whenever a uh, new short-term rental permit is issued, we notify neighbors, as I mentioned, within 600 feet. We would only do that upon renewal. If there's a change to something that may you know, be important for the neighbors to know if the, um, and the local contact has changed, for example, because we don't want them having their old notification and calling a number that is no longer valid. So that's the only time that we would re-notice neighbors is if there's a change to that or number of bedrooms or, or anything like that. Um, Transferability, we have always um, mentioned that these are non-transferable. We make it more explicit and explained in the amendments. Um, and then we in 
included an entire section about loss of operator in good standing status. And the reason that's important, again, as I mentioned, is operators in good standing were offered certain um, allowances if they had been paying TOT and BIA and if they were, uh, if they applied for their short-term rental permit by December 3rd, 2021, they were allowed to be within a thousand feet of any other non-hosted short-term rental. Um, if you, and so we go more into detail about how you can lose your operator in good standing status and clarify um, that that means you are now a new operator and you would have to comply with all the new requirements, including that 1,000 foot separation um, requirement. We add uh, more information about reasons for denial um, and we clarify the appeals process. There's a lot, it's a big chapter. Um, so registration requirements, technical changes, trying to make it easier to understand. Um, occupancy and parking, we don't change any of the occupancy or parking requirements. We just um, tried to make it easier to understand. And we clarify that parking size requirements have to be consistent with um, city standards, which they always have been, but we wanted to just bring that to the ordinance so there's no question that it's very, very clear and explicit. Um, and then we reorganized chapter, uh, sorry, section 2048-070, used to call it operational standards, went with more what we usually call things, which is operating requirements, rearranged a whole bunch of stuff to try to make it one big section before it had been separated out into different areas. And now it's still broken out by life safety and general within that same operational stand or operating requirements section, but we try to keep things flowing, that somebody could read through that and know exactly how to remain compliant um, and what they need to do. We do add something prohibiting bonfires in short, -ter in short term rentals. That is something we heard loud and clear from the community. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to explain why that is uh, a staff recommendation at this point. We add language for outdoor lighting. Again, these are things that are in our city code already, but if you are not familiar with that and you're just interested in short-term rentals, you may not know these things. So we, um, we add it right into the short-term rental chapter. There are some requirements related to trash and recycling. That was something we heard loud and clear from the community. Um, and I, we're hoping that it's not a, a burden on folks. It's just, a, it's just a, a trying to avoid a nuisance of having stuff out on the street longer or just piled up. It, we're just asking folks, hey, you know, keep your trash and recycling in the appropriate containers, take it out when it needs to be, you know, when Recology's driving their truck through and then put them away. Um, that, again, that was something that constituents really wanted to see. We add language about if we're in a drought again, if this hopefully never again, but well, let's be realistic, that if the council has declared a water shortage or any other type of drought, um, that short-term rentals will need to post information in the short-term rental unit so that folks know how to um, comply and how, you know, water reduction tips, that type of thing, and what we're expecting of them. And that's in line with all other lodging types in the city. So, um, you know, people coming from out of the area may not be familiar with, with having to, you know, watch their water. I mean, I, if you go to other parts of the country, sometimes they, they don't have water issues. So we just wanna make sure that everyone is aware of what we are expecting. And again, that would only be if the council has uh, declared a water shortage emergency or in, um, require, is requiring um, reduction of use. We also are adding a requirement to have exit fire and emergency signage, meaning somebody that walks in, just like at a hotel, by the door there's always, there's always that one map that shows you how to get out and, and that type of thing. We're trying to make it so that folks will know where fire extinguishers are, um, where a gas shutoff is, anything like that so that in case they're at a short term rental and an emergency happens, they're gonna know what to do and where to find it. Um, so it's just a real safety thing that we're, that we're hoping um, folks, that'll benefit folks. 
Enforcement, again, I'm going to go very high level on this. The experts are sitting behind me, and they'll be able to explain um, far better than I could or even want to attempt to. Um, basically, the code enforcement section was uh, – was it was an overhaul the um, person that wrote the original section is no longer with the city and so our new assistant chief building officer um, building official Lou Kirk wanted to have his hand at it and he did so it's been rewritten to explain when certain types of uh, penalties would be enforced and others would be enforced depending on the type of infraction it talks about local contact failure to respond um, pursuant to the requirements of the chapter. And we've heard a lot uh, from folks about, wow, these permit, uh, I'm sorry, these penalties seem pretty high. But what the city is doing with the proposed penalty structure is, is just being in line with the California government um, code for specific for short-term rentals. They have a specific carve-out for penalties for short-term rentals, and we're going to align with that. And again, Lou, can, Lou and Jesse can, can give more information on that if you're interested. Talks about um, when revocation would happen and what, how something is considered a verified, verified violation for um, consideration towards revocation. Oh, I almost hit it twice. That would have been awful because I'm not positive how to go backwards. I think the arrows. Anyway, so in order to approve zoning code text amendments, you have to make the following findings, um, which staff is able to do. The proposed amendment is consistent with the goals and policies of the general plan and any specific applicable specific plan. The proposed amendment is not detrimental to the public interest, health, safety, convenience, or wel welfare of the city, and in fact is trying to improve all of those, all of the above. It is internally consistent with other applicable provisions of the zoning code, except there is one difference, and that is that quiet hours are extended for short-term rentals. That is something both we've heard from the community and council members that they wanted to see. And so they, instead of being 10 to 6, Quiet hours are from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, the proposed amendment has been reviewed in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, which there's a sl whole slide about that later on, um, and is exempt. So next, we're going to talk about all the time that we've talked to the community and tried to get feedback. Um, this slide is referring to stuff that happened before that original ordinance was adopted in October of 2021. Again, as mentioned, we were in a, a very quick time frame. The Economic Development Subcommittee wanted us to bring something forward. It was, um, we were worried about fire, evacuation, all of that, um, and related to the uh, complaints that were coming in and just, no, we had had, um, a third party vendor do a presentation for us where they could scrape all of the different websites and they had estimated that there were approximately 350 short term rentals that were operating with no regulations. Um, so it was just determined we, need to, we needed to act and make sure everybody was able to um, have these regulations. So anyways, before we did that, we actually put out a survey that ended up with over 2,000 responses which was one of the biggest survey responses we've ever had. Um, and what that survey indicated was that, you know, folks were strongly in favor of having a permit requirement and occupancy limit. They wanted those extended quiet hours. They wanted the neighbors to know if, you know, if how to get a hold of somebody if there was something happening. They asked then for requiring a limit on the number of STRs. We did not include that in the first round. Um, Advertising requirements, annual renewal requirements, yes. They, there was a strong preference for a limit on the number of rental nights allowed per year. We did not include that. Um, and then again, obviously, they wanted to see some enforcement policies, which we included. So now, that, that was then, this is now. After last August, when we went back to the council and 
incorporated that 198 cap um, and explained the code enforcement situation, the policies a bit better. Council was like, okay, now you've got time, go out to the community, see what the community tells you, and then come back with what you hear. So. We've done a very robust community engagement process um, from that time forward. I mentioned already some of these things. Um, we started immediately meeting with industry representatives and neighborhood individuals and groups. We did another public survey, which there's a whole bunch that's gonna come to you about that in a bit. Um, and it's also in your packet. We did those pop-up events, like I mentioned, to meet people where they're at. We had those two citywide meetings that were virtual um, and uh, had Spanish translation available. We did that SRTBIA meeting. Um, we also did a, uh, met with the Roseland Community Building Initiative, the uh, Roseland CBI folks, and chatted with them about what they would like to see. And then we actually did a live radio broadcast on the first bilingual um, radio station in America. So that was a lot of fun. Now we're gonna dive into the survey a little bit. Um, I tried to group things and, and just add information here. There's a, a full survey report was attached to this uh, staff report. If somebody wants to dive deep, it has graphics, pie charts, and that time that type that might be a little bit easier, but if I would have put each one of those, we would have been here forever, and I've already talked a lot. So. Most of the people that responded to the survey um, identified as full-time Santa Rosa residents. Many of them own residential property or some own commercial property. 15% live in rental property. We tried very hard to reach out to um, our renters because we, what we've heard is that their concern, a lot of folks are concerned about how short-term rentals impact rental communities. and. Um, so we got 15%, which we would have liked to seen higher, but uh, I reached out to different rental agencies and, and there was no response. Anyways, so 87% of the respondents said they don't own a short-term rental and 13% own a uh, short-term rental in the city or somewhere else. Um, and as you can see here, um, Quite a few, well, more respondents live near a non-hosted STR than any other answer, but 36% also said they don't know if they do. One of the main questions was, how do you feel about the 198 non-hosted short-term rental citywide? And 63% said they felt that it should stay or that there should be even fewer. 35% said there shouldn't be a cap at all or that there should be more. 3% had no response to this. And then the question about whether the city should limit how many short-term rentals an entity can own, as you can see, was a strong majority, 68% said yes. Then we got into the specific questions about the 1,000 foot minimum distance. Basically, folks are saying they wanna keep it as it is or make it bigger. Um, the majority, I should say. Obviously, you can see here that some 29% said that it should be smaller. We asked specifically about downtown, whether, you know, if that's gonna be, should we look at that as more of a visitor destination, a tourist home, hub? But most people still said, no, we think that it should be the same everywhere. And then we talked about, how about in multifamily units, citywide and downtown? And most people said it should be 1,000 feet, more than 1,000 feet, or not allowed in multifamily units at all. And what we're talking about are shared walls, like apartments and that type of thing. We did not include anything um, preventing that. Uh, that is not part of our recommendation, but as you can see here, that was something that the community um, did respond uh, more towards. And then code enforcement felt that the penalties are adequate or not harsh enough. Um, and then 19% said they're too harsh. 6% didn't answer. And then here you can see where the respondents live within the city. Um, it's important to note that 10% of the respondents didn't live in the city at all and admitted that. And then 10% didn't respond to this question. And that could be when we were out at pop-up events, we would try to link to this council map, but then it would kick some folks out of the survey, unfortunately. So that's a glitch that we're gonna try to figure out how to, um, how to make better next time we're out and about with iPads trying to get folks to take a survey for us. So 
Um, the majority, as you can see, well, the majority, the highest number of respondents are in Council District 4, four excuse me, followed by 3 and 2, but we did get response from everywhere, so we did try. Okay, so from that outreach, some of that informs the actual proposed amendments that you have before you tonight, but it's important to note that what folks were saying to us, um, that they see that the folks that are very interested in keeping short-term rentals or even having more of them cite that they bring economic benefits to the city through TOT and BIA and potentially, you know, folks buying stuff, going to a market that, you know, increases sales tax, that they provide a lot of business opportunities, whether that's property management, house cleaners, um, concierge services, that type of thing. Um, they, folks cite that they have a positive impact on tourism and that, again, that uh, guests visit our local attractions, businesses and restaurants. They offer alternative lodging for traveling families and professionals. And I would like to add here folks with a dog, maybe, or a cat that couldn't stay in a hotel. Um, they, a lot of folks have said they have allowed them to keep their home in challenging economic times. That non-hosted short-term rentals provide greater income and flexibility than having a long-term renter and that um, for some folks, they wanna be able to have a non-hosted short-term rental when they live in a different place for part of the year, um, they'd be able to use their house to make money while they are away. Oh, I went too far, let's go back. So then we hear from folks who feel um, that short-term rentals have more disadvantages. And as you can see here, the, a, a very common thing that we hear is that short-term rentals are really a hotel or a business and that they otherwise would not be allowed in a residential neighborhood. That that original 1,000 foot non-hosted separation, since it, it didn't apply to those early um, applicants, there are certain areas of the city that are still um, suffering from over-concentration. Uh, folks feel that it's it's not quite fair that short-term rentals don't have the same degree of inspections and restrictions that other lodging types have. That um, we hear this one very frequently that short-term rentals potentially remove a residential unit that could be used by someone or a family that would like to live full-time in the community. Uh, the inflating real estate prices and or rental um, prices and that we've heard from people that are actual realtors say that if they wanted to sell their house, they would have to disclose that a short-term rental is nearby, which could negatively impact their home values. And then obviously, you know, folks have heard throughout the country and even some local incidents where there have been some, you know, awful things happen at short-term rentals and that neighbors feel like it could happen any time that somebody is uh, renting out the house next door type of thing. And I'm sure many of us can attest to the fact that sometimes it has gotten unpleasant between neighbors who want to run a short-term rental business and neighbors who live next door to them. Um, we've heard that short-term rentals can have a negative effect on neighborhood cohesiveness and character. And you know, I, I'm reading these things, but you're gonna hear all that from the people in the audience. So I really don't think we need to get into that. I, I think you'll hear a lot from folks that are actually experiencing these things. Um, and you have a chance to, to read that in your packet. But you can see that overall it's, it's um, yeah. Okay, so based on community response, the, the things that came out strongly that we are not including in our proposed amendments here are that um, folks would like to see, some folks would like to see short-term rentals prohibited in, non-hosted short-term rentals prohibited in residential zones, period. Um, some folks want to see the STR cap decreased or eliminated, and some people want to see it increased so that there would be more or less allowed non-hosted short-term rentals. Same thing with the setback. Um, and then for multifamily units, should they be the same thing where it's 1,000 foot between property line to property line so that if there is more than one in an apartment complex, but they're on the same parcel, that would be allowed the way the ordinance is now. Um, 
the staff doesn't have any of that in this proposed packet. Um, obviously, Planning Commission and City Council can add anything or change anything that we are proposing tonight. Um, one of the considerations is that folks that have gone through the process and received their permit, um, is it is is it right for staff without having been given that direction from a review authority to make that uh, recommendation? So as it says here, we have not been given um, any direction to make fundamental changes to the ordinance. Okay, we're, we're getting near the end. Um, so as I mentioned in the earlier part, this is not uh, subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. It is uh, the uh, adoption of this ordinance will not result in a direct or reasonably foreseeable indirect physical change in the environment. And then we cite a couple of other reasons that it is exempt. So with, with all that, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the Planning Commission by resolution recommend to City Council adoption of zoning code text amendments to Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, Chapter 20-48, Short-Term Rentals, to revise and add new definitions and policies and to incorporate technical changes, including reorganization and clarifying language to improve functionality and aid in implementation and enforcement. So that is finally the end of my presentation, and I'm Sherry Meads. We've got Jessica Jones here that y'all know, and like I said, we've got folks either on Zoom or um, with us. I, I missed Ryan Corcoran, who is uh, one of our police captains who has been working with us on this effort. He is also here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, so now, uh, are there questions of staff at this moment? Commissioner Cisco. Uh, yeah, I have a couple that are uh, specific to Sherry and then um, some from code enforcement and and maybe one for um, the fire marshal. So I'll start with Sherry and if, I guess if other people want to do Sherry, they can do that. Sorry. I'm, I'm just going to start with Sherry, but there'll be other questions when, and then we'll, when, when you call them down. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Sherry, could you, uh, one of the findings we have to make is that uh, the, the, this is consistent with the general plan, the short-term rentals, and we've gotten a lot of letters saying that they aren't consistent with the general plan. So could you just say a bit more about how, how you're determining that short-term rentals are consistent with the general plan in residential areas? Well, I'll give a quick answer and then I'm going to defer to Jessica, who is better at this than I am. Um, They're definitely consistent with the economic development part of the general plan and goals and policies. And I will defer to Jess for the rest of the answer. Sure, thank you, and thanks for that question. Um, so one of the things that we're hearing is that this is that short-term rentals are um, a business uh, locating in a residential area, um, and so you know, staff has looked very closely into this. Um, we do have other um, businesses that are allowed to locate in residential areas, and you know, in our review of this, uh, this falls in line with that. Some examples are uh, home occupations. There is a list of various types of home occupations um, that are allowed in residential districts, um, some of which uh, do include uh, home occupations that allow um, both customers and clients um, and uh, you know, deliveries and, and that type of thing coming to the home. Um, uh, small and large family daycares are another example of that where you have uh, uh, customers and, and such coming to the home in a residential area. We also do allow some uh, small retail establishments in residential areas that provide services uh, to residents. So th those are just some examples. Um, and based on staff's analysis, uh, we found that uh, the short-term rentals would fit in um, alongside those those types of uses um, and is consistent with the general plan. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, again, um, Ms. Meads, if there's a duplex owner, would that be considered one unit or if they wanted both halves of their duplex, would that be considered two units? 
So anything that has an address has to have its own permit. Okay. So the duplex would likely have two addresses, so it would need two permits. Okay, great. Yeah, and just, just to quickly clarify, as it relates to concentration, um, the concentration requirements in the code um, have a, a distance requirement of 1,000 feet, and that distance requirement is between property, property lines, not between units. So if you have a duplex that is on one, un, on one lot, um, then both of those units could have a non-hosted uh, permit. Okay. But then that owner would have their maximum of... The, it would be one permit one. per unit. Per unit, okay. Correct. And then, um, you listed um, for the, the non-hosted, those are allowed in any, res, uh, any zoning district. And then for the hosted, I mean, for the hosted, you did that. And then for non-hosted, you listed all <laughs> the zoning districts I could ever think of. I'm just curious, what zoning district would they not be allowed in? So at this point, I believe public institutional and open space related districts <laughs> are the only ones where they're, oh, and mobile home park. And then, ooh, I'd have to double check, but I think we carved out um, where the motor vehicle district too, that they wouldn't be allowed there. Okay, great. That's all I have for Sherry. Okay, does anybody else have questions for Sherry at this time? Okay, Commissioner Sanders. I think I have questions for you, but I'm not 100% sure if they're for you, so I'm gonna try my best. Um, when we were talking about, if, if I wanted to get information about the violations that were recorded prior to the urgency ordinance versus post-urgency ordinance, is that a question for you or is that someone? That could be Jesse, because Lou may not have been here during that time, but knowing Lou, he's probably brushed up on all of it, but it's definitely not me. It's one of these two gentlemen to my right. So should I wait to ask that, or should I just? Yeah, why don't we okay. try and get all the questions for Sherry, and then we'll go to Jesse and Lou. So um, do you have other questions that you think might? Okay. I've got a bunch, but I'm not sure if they're just for okay. Sherry, so I'll, I'll, I'll hold for now. Suggestions from? Uh, the attorney as to how we should do this, just go back and forth. Uh, that would be at your discretion, Chair. I don't okay. have any particular order. You may want to group things in, um, in by, by person or you want to group them by category of proposed amendments. Um, that would be at, at, as you wish. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and since they are sitting there, we'll go ahead and go, go ahead and ask your questions, and then we'll go back to Commissioner Cisco. And sorry for the convoluted. Thank thing. you. Leave it to the new guy to uh, <laughs> make it all weird. Um, thanks. Um, so violations. We'll go back to that first question. Violations prior to the ordinance, and compared to violations after the urgency ordinance. Numbers. Uh, well, good evening, Chair Weeks, uh, Vice Chair Peterson, and members of the Commission. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I, I have that information. I do not have it at hand, but I can certainly make it available to the Commission. Okay. So in, hmm, would you say that things have gotten better with noise and nuisance complaints post uh, urgency ordinance? I would say so, yes. Uh, with the adoption of the amended urgency ordinance, uh, we saw a very high level of activity, and we've been on what I like to call a glide path down towards a maintenance level, and uh, yeah, we're definitely moving in the right direction. Okay, okay, good. Um, do we know how many um, host, ho non-hosted STRs are owned by people who reside in Santa Rosa? I believe that information was in the staff report. Is it? Did I miss it? Yes, as of... As of April 13th, we had 58 hosted and 167 non-hosted. And do we know how many live outside of Santa Rosa? I'm sure that's probably the line right below that, right? Um, I missed it. That is not included because staff does not have, I can get that information, but staff does not have the discretion to um, approve or not approve based on where someone lives. I can tell you that I, I did pull that information um, just out of my own curiosity for the folks that own multiple um, short-term rental permits, just 
I was just curious if um, it was mainly people that live here or not. Um, I just got to flip through all my all my paper here. The majority were Santa Rosa residents for that group, but okay. not all. There were like five of the 25 that were out of, were not city of Santa Rosa folks. Okay. And along that, those lines, do we know how many non-hosted, because I guess what we're talking about primarily is non-hosted, considering that hosted have free reign, except in open space, mobile home parks, possibly some of the other things that you talked about. Do we know how many are owned by corporate interest? None. Um, Zero. That is something, at least they're not supposed to be. Uh, that is something that was agreed, or you know, that council recommended and that we followed through with. An LLC even cannot own a, no business entity can be issued a short-term rental permit. It has to be a natural person or a trust of natural persons. Okay, so that brings me to a very uh, next question is, are we potentially messing with someone's estate planning? Because oftentimes people will hold a property in trust and then that will be held under the umbrella of an LLC, which limits liability to that, to the operators of that LLC. But for tax purposes, it's pass through income, so it's kind of treated as, you know, ordinary income and there's no corporate veil on your LLC. Is there, is there any potential problems that we see by limiting LLC uh, ability to hold these properties that may end up messing with someone's retirement plans, their estate planning? I can defer to Ashley, but I, I mean, I will just say that that is never our intent. However, we don't have a mechanism at this point to be, well, this type of LLC is okay, this type of LLC is not okay. That's not, I mean, we're planners, we're not attorneys, and so we don't look at that level. We just, per council direction, limited liability corporation is a corporation. Um, and we don't require any specific insurance for these particular things, some jurisdictions do. So I think that was also um, a consideration when going, you know, deciding to follow just no business entities whatsoever. And we would hope that somebody could, you know, continue within their trust and that that could, some, that could still work within their plans. Do you have anything to add to that? Actually. I don't have much to add to uh, what Planner Meads has said. Uh, I'm not an estate planner, but I have not been made aware of any issues uh, or problems as, as far as I have heard since the enactment of the first ordinance uh, in all of the permitting that we have completed to date. Okay. Um, I'm just going to keep chugging. Is that okay? I'm sorry. Should I keep going or should go, go, I? Yes. Let's nope. just go ahead. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I've got a lot of questions. What can I say? Um, so when we were picking the 198 as the cap, and you explained that that was the number of permits uh, in process at that point, um, was there any consideration, and I guess this is going back to prior, the uh, urgency ordinance, was there any consideration to doing a percentage as opposed to a number, or maybe um, establishing zones? I mean, we have a great freeway that, you know, a couple of freeways that bisect our city. You know, so many in that zone, so many in that zone, northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest. Why 198? I mean, I understand why, but was right. there consideration to something else? So when we first did the um, urgency ordinance in October of 2021, we were we didn't bring any of those specific things to the council. Those were determined the evening of the meeting. They were driven by council direction. What we had heard was the importance of protecting our housing stock and protecting our neighborhood cohesiveness. And so we were looking for a way to um, limit the number of non-hosted short-term rental permits from day one and also try to keep them from overrunning neighborhoods. And, and that was um, how we ended up with 
you know, the urgency ordinance to begin with, and then the cap was based on we were, we had a slog of permits to get through, and we were also thinking more in terms, again, of protecting housing stock, and this was one mechanism to do that. Um, we did not look at percentages or districts. That was not something that was um, directed for us to do. Um, some jurisdictions do, and some jurisdictions just eliminate them in residential zones or have a percentage, like you said. Right. We have always, we've been in a housing crisis for, you know, for a long time, the Tubbs fire, we still haven't rebuilt everything there. I don't think Jesse can probably tell me that. So it, it was always one of the th concerns was to limit the number of, of units that would be potentially removed from long-term occupancy. So at where the 198 is, you said something that we have close to 70,000 housing units. 60, 69 something something like that not so, not all of which would be able to be non-hosted short-term rentals that's right. just a general number exactly. that yeah so we're at one less than one percent that's correct at what percentage do, does one percent affect do we know the effect of one percent of strs that it has on our housing stock well what we do know is that the 198 are potentially not being used for long-term housing that, I mean, that's just a common sense equation. It doesn't necessarily mean that's true, but if those 198 homes were coming in on a new subdivision project, we'd be really excited about that. Right, I mean, you're right. I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is, is there a sweet spot where there's a number of operable STRs that does not impact housing stock? I mean, if, if it was- That's up to y'all. If it's 4%, would we see, is there something that we could see? We're at less than 1%. So I, I wanna make sure that if, when we're making a, you know, decisions that we're making decisions based on, especially if we're gonna say, we're protecting housing, right? If we're less than 1%, is there some way to find out how that percentage actually affects the availability, availability of housing in? I, I'll say one thing and then I'm gonna to defer to Jess, and that is I did receive emails from folks, especially from Coffee Park, that were saying they lost their housing because of it being turned into a short-term rental. But I'm gonna let Jess answer that. Yeah, so if I may, uh, Commissioner, uh, I think at this point we don't have an answer to that question. It's something that we certainly can um, research and in particular reach out to our housing department uh, to try to find an answer to that, but we don't have an answer tonight. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I guess it's coming back to my guys here, I think. Um, so we get noise and nuisance complaints. Do we know that they are noise and nuisance complaints from people who are operators in good standing or new operators, or are they outside, or, you know, outside of our permitting process? Or, you know, and I guess maybe the question is, how many uh, short-term rentals are being operated in Santa Rosa that are rogue operators? And are those noise complaints being attributed to those who are operators in good standing? There's a lot in that question. Let me let me let me try to unpack it. Um, with regard to our responding uh, to a complaint on any given STR on a noise issue, um, if it's a permitted STR, we would address it as a noise issue. If it's an unpermitted STR, we would go down a different path because they don't have a permit to operate to begin with, um, whether we were aware of them or not. So. From a statistic standpoint, we'd probably record that as an unpermitted STR. Um, what I can tell you is that um, since September of uh, last year, we've, uh, of all of the 281 code enforcement complaints we've received, eight have pertained to noise. Some of those have been for the same property. Uh, and I apologize for not having that broken out uh, specifically, but uh, it's a relatively small part of the total complaint load that we take in on STRs. You're getting ahead of me on my questions, thank you. Um, the same property, do we know how many frequent flyers we have? That's what we used to call them in the fire department. There are um, frequent flyers. How many people, how many STR operators are, or do they exist that 
garner the lion's share of complaints. And then on the other side of that, are there, you know, complaints coming in from one or a few, you know, Am I making sense with that question? Yes, we, we receive we receive a variety of complaints from a variety of, of sources, and um, my only concern is whether the complaint is valid. I, I don't really I don't look at where it came from. I don't look at what the motivations might be for it. I just look at whether there's substance to it. Um, I, uh, much as your other question, um, I can give you a specific number of frequent flyers, as you say, but just as a general overview, I can say that of the approximately 290 cases, uh, complaints, I should say, that we've received, it involves approximately 200 properties. So, so at least um, a, a, a substantial portion of the remaining properties have several. I can tell you that um, quite a few of them have two or three, less have four or five. I don't think any has more than five. And again, these are, these are over time. If, if two complaints come in the same day for the same property, we, we would typically count that as one complaint. Okay. Oh, I see. So multiple people call because there's a party going on over here. That's one complaint. Yeah, we, we don't want to overburden our system when we don't need to, so we'll just make a notation in, in the case file that we have a number of complainants. Right. Okay. Thank you. And um, this, my questions are all over the place, so forgive me. This was free-form typing as I was getting prepared for today. Um, about ADUs. Now, I was reading, and, and I thought it said that ADUs constructed prior to January 11th, 2018, were exempt. But then I think you said that that's no longer the case. They're all unable to be used as short-term rental. Is that correct? So yes and no. Um, originally, when we wrote the ordinance, the October 2021 ordinance, staff cited back to our ADU ordinance, which had an amendment that became effective on January 11th, mm -hmm. 2018 that stated um, ADUs cannot be used for short-term rentals, essentially rentals of less than 30 days. So some ADUs that were built before that time have received permits because of that. That is something that the council, council wanted them to not be in ADUs at all, to protect that housing stock as what, ten, what is intended to be lower rental rate um, availability for folks. So what this amendment package does says, from now on, we are not going to look at that 2018 date. We're gonna say if you come in with an application, a new application for an ADU, it's going to be denied because they're not allowed in ADUs. Okay. If you received a permit already for your ADU based on the original ordinance, if you stay in good standing and you renew before it's expired and that type of thing, we're not trying to take that away from anyone. Does okay. that make sense? Yes, absolutely, Great. thank you. And so if that person, that, that would be an operator in good standing, that's correct. They, We're trying to get away from that terminology. Thank you. It's um, very confusing. It's very confusing. <laughs> so it, it's just somebody that's compliant. Got it. So in, in, in a sense, could I say grandfathered? If they had, if they... Try not to say that too. Oh, yeah. There's somebody that has a permit now and they remain compliant. Okay. They're able to keep it. Okay, so that person. <laughs> that person. That person. Um, they decide that they want to renovate their ADU and they have to pull permits for that renovation. Do, do the new permits that are being pulled become the new date of consideration or are they still that person. I'll, I'll have just confirm my thing, but it should not be related whatsoever. Okay. The STR permit is the STR permit and the building permits would be the building permits. Okay. Almost done. Almost done. Um, you had mentioned that um, the, the concept behind uh, reducing the number of STRs owned by an individual um, was the goal is to create more equity. Like why can you have two, I can't have one kind of thing. Was there any other considerations made on how to achieve that equity? 
for example, you could have, okay, you can have two, we're gonna raise the cap to this. You can have five and we'll raise the cap to, the, or get rid of the cap altogether. Um, that is something that is totally within your purview as a review authority, but that would be a substantial change to what council has given us direction for, okay. which you can see in the current ordinance. So we, we haven't received direction for that and that is not something that staff would just um, determine on their own. Just give me a second. When we're talking about the um, outreach, and there was a lot of outreach, was I didn't notice any out or let me let me rephrase that. Um, was there outreach to STR owner groups specifically to ask their opinion about nuisance complaints and? And things like that, and who were they, if, if there were? So we met with um, some of my favorite people that are in the audience now, um, representatives from the Sonoma County Coalition of Hosts. Um, I, uh, anybody that, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm supposed to say names of people. Um, Gary Letts and a few of his, his cohort came and met with us. We were willing to meet with anyone, um, and we did. We met with you know people that are very pro short-term rental, and we met with people in neighborhoods that, that feel like they affect their lives in a very negative way. So we definitely tried to make ourselves available to anyone, um, and I, I specifically even reached out to a person that has written many emails and offered to meet, and um, that didn't happen, but we've you know, we've tried to reach out to, I'm sure there's more, I'm sure there are more people we could talk to, but we also just put out an open invitation to anybody that wanted to talk to us. Um, I mean, that's the fun part of the job, is talking to the folks. I guess the reason I ask um, that is, um, I would love to hear their take on how they police their business. You know. I think you will hear some of that tonight. Yes, thank you. My last one, yay! <laughs> for now, you have uh, for, now for now, for now, for um, now. I've been talking to or, or reading a lot of emails from people who are um, owner occupant. That's their primary residence. Mm -hmm. And they want to be able to, you know, rent out their house to go visit this one family in particular to visit their daughter who lives like in Pakistan. And they are able to, you know, say, hey, we're, we're leaving. They go to their neighbors and knock on the door and, and say, hey, can you keep an eye on the place? We've got some renters that are coming in and everybody's good. And then they go and do their thing. They also have a actual non-hosted short-term rental. Is there any consideration or should, was there any consideration, I guess, made to what I call part-time short-term renters so that, you know, they're not you know, sort of swept out from being able to, you know, take advantage of renting out their primary residence. They're not necessarily out buying, you know, properties for the sole purpose of, you know, making a profit. They're, you know, able to do it because, you know, Bottle Rock comes and, and they can rent their place out. Should we, any consideration of that? So Maybe we, putting language in there? We looked at a lot of things as a staff working group and, and you see a few of us here, but at um, prior to the adoption of the October ordinance, we met with people from every department almost. Um, and we looked at, at, at different options and that type of thing. And one of the things that was a concern was actually, well, it doesn't matter, it was the enforcement of something like that. How would we know if somebody really is only gone a certain period of the year? Where do you cut that off? It's okay if it's three months or it has to be less than six months. How would we, how would we keep track of that? Um, and so that person would be able to apply for a non-hosted short-term rental permit. Absolutely they would um, for that type of use and or they could rent their property out to something, to someone or a group for longer than 30 days. But what you're, what you're describing of someone leaving 
and leaving it as a, as a non-hosted short-term rental, essentially, they would be required to obtain a permit for that. Thank you. Um, that's it for now, thank you. We're still here, so. Okay, so let's go back to Commissioner Cisco and her questions for code enforcement. Um, just for education purposes, could you describe how complaints are addressed? What, what the actual code enforcement process is if somebody you know, issues some kind of a complaint? Uh, certainly, that would, uh, that would depend upon the nature of the complaint, first of all. Uh, if it was a noise complaint, which we call a point in time complaint, our goal would be to be on site to witness it ourselves. Uh, to that end, we established a hotline that allows uh, an officer to be reached at any time of the day or night, and we're, uh, we've been pretty good at responding within about half an hour. Um, so uh, again, documenting the violation is key for any enforcement action. Um, other types, uh, if a complaint comes in uh, regarding an unpermitted uh, STR, the first thing I'm going to do is look at Airbnb and see if I can find their advertisement. Uh, there's my proof that they're operating. Uh, I know they don't have an STR, and then we enter into that uh, that dialogue with the owner to, to try to bring them into compliance. Um, if it's uh, an approved STR that has a uh, an error in their advertisement, which happens frequently, again, we reach out and we, we contact them and, and uh, work to gain compliance. Um, there's a variety of other types of violations. We get uh, lighting complaints uh, where it's a glare. So um, that's fairly uh, repeatable. So it, it doesn't have the same urgency that a noise complaint would. But we would go out after hours and look at it in the dark from the neighbor's property and, and try to come up with some solutions to, again, mitigate, mitigate that violation. Um, that covers most of the scenarios. There's always going to be different uh, things, but but I think the common the commonality here is that we want to document it, we want to see it ourselves, and and then we'll reach out to the responsible party and, and uh, work towards compliance. And if I may, thank you. If I may, sorry, I turned it off when I moved yeah. it. <laughs> Uh, Jesse Oswald, Chief Building Official. Um, one thing I want to point out in this ordinance is this is a ministerial ordinance, and that's, that's significantly different than most ordinances that are enforced. Normally ordinances that uh, address code enforcement or any type of violations are discretionary or have a lot of discretion built into them. This ordinance is very specifically non-discretionary. It is 100% ministerial. So when Lou talks about a verified ver uh, violation, meaning we have verified that noise complaint or a lighting complaint, we are mandated by the ordinance to cite for that violation. So that is a big change uh, to, to the typical code enforcement uh, actions where we can give people a few chances to come into compliance for the weeds and rubbish in their yard uh, in anything that is specifically in this ordinance that is is a, potentially a violation we are required by this local law to provide that citation which we talked about with the one two and three with a certain fine amount so I wanted to point that out for for the Commission okay and um, if I have a noise complaint in my neighborhood that doesn't have an STR, doesn't involve an STR, I, I call the police. What happens if somebody has a noise complaint, don't know about your hotline, and they call the police? Kind of what, What's the avenue of how they end up getting to you? We've worked very closely with the police department and, and you know, working that out. And the, the, um, the dispatchers are all aware of the code enforcement um, response number. And to, so if it, if it turns out during the course of the conversation that it's related to an STR, they would find their way to us and then we would continue on that process. I know there's also a scenario where uh, a police, police officer might respond to a noise complaint where not even the complainant knows it's STR related and, and the officer might realize once he's there that it's an STR. At that point in time, again, it would find its way to us. To my knowledge, that has not happened yet. Okay, great. Excuse me, Captain Corcoran, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, you can just go right there if you want. I just didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add. Sure, just live. 
So we programmed our CAD system with all of the STR locations and when someone calls about an address, it pops up on the screen to notify code enforcement with the phone number. So the dispatcher doesn't put a call for service in, they direct the person to contact code enforcement on their 24 seven hotline. And then that person goes out. <clears throat> if for example, the code enforcement officer decides that this is something that's uh, beyond their control, they'll contact us and we'll send an officer out to assist them. Um, since November, when we've been working together with code enforcement, we haven't had that happen. Code enforcement has done a great job handling uh, all of the complaints that have come up. Great, thanks for that. Thank and, you. And then just one last kind of big picture question. Um, do we know kind of the cost benefit analysis here of the income to the city or benefit uh, to the city tax wise, TOT wise from the short term rentals versus the cost of your team and enforcement? Do we have any idea about that? I, this is gonna be a two part answer, I think. Um, so on the code enforcement side, up until now, again, since approximately August or September of last year, we've had a full-time officer dedicated full-time to this task. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we are um, approaching a, a little bit more of a maintenance mode. Um, that being said, I'm also cognizant of the fact that we're going into summer, and I'm expecting that to come back up a little bit. So uh, we've only been doing this for you know less than a year, so we still have to kind of work through the seasons and, and the process to get a better idea of what kind of activity we're going to see uh, year round. Um, in terms of, well, I'll, I'll leave it there and then I'll, I'll defer to Sherry on the, on the question of, uh, of, of costs. So I, I can't really do a cost benefit analysis, but I can refer to um, page 16 in the staff report that indicates the TOT remitted and the BIA assessments collected in 21 and 2022. Um, and I can also, if, if, any, if the commission needs, I can explain where those funds go. Um, I will also say that total application fees, including renewals and renoticing, um, where that was required um, since the inception of the, the permit process is $339,775. I will also say that when we designed the uh, cost of the permit based on the standard temporary use permit, um, we anticipated that being basically the same level of staff review. And I think that we found in many cases it actually exceeds that considerably. And it was strictly to be a cost recovery basis. It was not intended to, you know, it was just to cover staff cost. I don't know if that helps at all. It does, and, and you are expecting that with renewals, the staff time would be reduced because you would already have information. Exactly. So. Okay, great, Thank thanks. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Duggan. Oops. Yeah, thank you. I've got a couple of questions. The first one is kind of theoretical, like um, Ms. Meads has made um, reference to the, the, the cap. It could be up to us, like we could just change it and, you know, just uh, pulling from uh, Commissioner Sanders' questioning. Uh, what if we said, let's do 4% of all the housing stock? Like, how would that impact staff at the planning and the code enforcement level? Uh, again, I think this will be a two-part answer. On, on a code enforcement level, if, I, I think it stands to reason that if we see more permitted units, we'll receive more complaints, uh, at least for a while. Um, that being said, um, it probably wouldn't exceed the, the level of activity we saw right at the very beginning of this process when we, we literally had 100 cases open at a time. Um, and then as far as the planning side, I'll, uh, I'll defer to Sherry. I think I'm gonna let Jess answer that one. <laughs> 
so yeah, I can speak to that. Um, at this point, I mean, it, it, part of it is gonna, would depend on if uh, the commission recommends and the council adopts an increase in the cap or removes it completely. Um, if if it is an increase, um, you know, staff is going to, and, and even with the current cap, uh, we're gonna need to figure out how we're gonna accept new applications and the process for that whenever we have, you know, uh, if we've got less permits out there than what the cap currently is. Um, if the cap is removed completely, um, you know, I would anticipate that we would get uh, an influx in new applications for those folks that have not been able to apply for a non-hosted permit, um, but not to the extent that we saw when the uh, process was first put into place. So at this point, I, I wouldn't expect to need additional staffing uh, to make the process work. Okay, thank you. And then I've got some sort of more nitty gritty um, technical questions, I think, for the building official and the code enforcement. But I assume that when somebody applies uh, for a permit, that there has to be some sort of on-site inspection and that you look for things like, um, you know, smoke and fire detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, fire extinguishers, and that they have to meet certain requirements. So that, ha that has actually been discussed about uh, on-site inspections or not. With the initialization of the very first urgency ordinance, there was a desire, but not the means. And it was discussed again. And uh, we are in essentially in the same situation is that we are not proposing any on-site inspections, if I am correct, simply due to what that, what we would in have to include in this ordinance going forward, staffing and complete costing for additional staff to facilitate on-site inspections. So it's all verification through self-certification, meaning their presented application materials have to meet those very specific standards shown on literally a plan. Doesn't have to be a great plan, but it does have to show those full, full compliance with all those measures. So we're just... Um leaving it to host to represent that they have a code compliant structure that has all these things, you know, all these requirements in it, but we're not going out and actually looking for them to make sure that the building is safe. That is correct. And, and if I may, during the review process, we do a, a, what would essentially be a background uh, investigation, so to speak, for a property anyway, to, to verify that it doesn't have any violations and that they are applying for a short-term rental in a structure that is known, at least by record, to be uh, in compliance with all codes and regulations as it is. Thank you. And if I could, real quick, uh, Commissioner, um, uh, just to add on to the question about, you know, if we were to raise or eliminate the cap the impact on planning, um, staffing, and processing permits, the other thing to keep in mind is that if that were to happen, uh, we still have the uh, concentration requirement for non-hosted permits, which is a thousand feet, and so that would limit the total number of permits overall that could come in. I believe Sherry has a potential estimate on that. Yeah, so I actually asked our GIS team to take the map of where uh, short-term, non-hosted short-term rental permits are currently, and then determine if we totally saturated the city with them still following that 1,000-foot separation, how many could there be? And so it was 648 additional non-hosted short-term rental permits if they were placed exactly as needed to be um, to meet that 1,000 foot separation. Thank you. Other, uh, Vice Chair Peterson. Um, I'm gonna try and keep this quick. Uh, I think this is, this is building on a, a comment. So this is probably for Sherry or maybe uh, Ms. Jones. So what, what kind of businesses are restricted in residential zoning? What, are, what businesses are not allowed? We heard the ones that were allowed. So we'd have to pull up the zoning code, but um, basically what what is allowed is, again, um, home occupations that meet certain criteria. Um, there's listed out in our code. Um, and uh, 
daycares of uh, varying sizes, um, type uses. So any, we have a, a list in our code of allowed uses and any use that is not included in that list is basically not allowed. So, um, you know, heavy commercial or, you know, m more major commercial type uses other than a neighborhood serving type retail use would not be allowed. Um, are bed and breakfasts permitted in every residential zoning district? Yes, they are. With a use, with a use with, yeah, excuse me, with a minor use permit. But, but not, by, as, not by right? Not by right, that is correct. Um, are there any home occupations that are in that list that are allowed in these residential zoning districts, districts where the owner is not home? So we don't specify that the the property owner needs to be home. Um, and in fact, you know, with a uh, property owner's signature, if there was, you know, somebody who was renting the property and living there as a tenant, uh, they could get a home occupation permit um, for that, uh, for, you know, whatever business they happen to be running, um, as long as we get a signature from the property owner. Uh, put a finer point out where the resident isn't at home? So again, it, it, there's no restrictions against, uh, the, the code does not specify that the resident living in the property needs to be there at all times when the home occupation is there. It, it, the home occupation is for the person living there, so I think theoretically it's, you know, when it's an operation, that person would be there, but there's no regulations that require that in our code. I'll, I'll leave that for now. And um, are there any restrictions on residential zoning for long-term rentals? I mean, can I, I, if I, in any residential zoning district, can I long-term rent my property? Yes, and that would not require any permit. Thank you. That's all I've got. Any other questions before I, I do my questions? Oh, Commissioner Sanders. <laughs> You again. Me again. Um, are the fees that we're charging now have gone up, right, from fifteen from five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for the first offense? And are you speaking of the fees or the fines? Oh, I'm sorry, fines. Excuse me. Yes. Um, are all fines the same? So the fine for uh, the wild party that got busted up is the same first fifteen hundred dollar fine for missing signage. If it's related to an STR, yes, it would all be on the same schedule. <laughs> one last one. Are, are there any um, uh, ADA requirements? I don't believe so. The, the short answer is no. Um, the, the discussion throughout the entire state through all levels of regulatory bodies has landed that these are still residentially based occupancies, meaning it still lives and breathes like a, a dwelling. So there are no ADA, so to speak, requirements. Thank you. Okay, so I have a few questions. Um, and they're kind of, te they're more technical questions, I think. Uh, how do you build TOT and the BIA assessment? Sorry, Sherry. I apologize, I was looking at something else. Could you please repeat that, Chair? Sure. Uh, how, how do you bill the TOT and the BIA? Is that through the finance department? Yes, so the revenue folks send out a um, letter or something that says, okay, it's time again, can you send us your receipts and um, the, um, the amount due? So that is a completely separate process than planning. Um, and then in the um, proposed text amendment changes, it talks about permit posting. And is that, would that be inside or outside? Yes, it's inside. Um, and the idea behind that is so that the uh, short-term renters have access to what the um, standard requirements are for their occupancy and parking and that type of thing. And uh, 
How would you maintain a list for new STR? So if say we stay with the cap of 198, somebody sells or doesn't renew, and so there'd be an opening. Um, would you, like throughout the year, maintain a list, or how would you do that? That's something we're working on. Okay. So I, I would add that through our permitting system, uh, we have a dashboard, and it's actually a, a public dashboard that's on our website that provides the number of permits that are in process, um, the, the number that have been issued, denied, withdrawn. Uh, so uh, anybody can go and see how many both non-hosted and hosted permits are, are currently available. So if um, I had a piece of property that I was interested in turning into an STR, I could go on and kind of sign up for any updates or whatever. Yes, our website has a, a, a section um, on the main website for um, signing up for notifications, but uh, we do have that online tool that anybody can go to. I will say since that uh, uh, cap of 198 was put into place, um, staff has not been accepting any new applications, and at this point we're waiting to see the outcome of this process um, and are, are keeping an eye on how many permits are currently, um, again, in process as well as issued. Um, and and then we will figure out a process um, once you know we determine if the cap is going to remain or be altered in some way, um, how we want to start accepting new applications. Um, on the, the, the fees, and I'm following up on Commissioner Sanders' question about the, the fee, the, I'm sorry, fines for the, um, for different things. Was there any thought about having, say, a parking fine a fine around parking be different than a fine around noise or a fine around fire pit or garbage or whatever? The way the government code is set up, it establishes that fine schedule for, S for violations of an STR ordinance. So the way we interpret that is we look at our ordinance and anything that's specifically identified within it as being a violation of that ordinance would apply. Um, now, let's look at something that wouldn't apply. Say, an inoperative vehicle in the driveway for months, uh, and it happens to be an SDR. That's still a code violation, uh, but it would not be fined at uh, that schedule. It would be fined using the normal schedule, which would be uh, $100 for a first uh, violation. Um, and. The way the, it's, the, way the uh, amendments are written is that uh, you would, your permit would be revoked if you have three violations in a year. Why in a year? Why not just three violations, period, even if they span three years? Um, so I'm sure there's a reason for that, but I'd like to hear it. So that's built off of, again, the government code provisions that have to do with those fine amounts. Those fine amounts escalate based upon being within a certain amount of time of each other. So if, for example, a first uh, citation was issued for uh, $1,500 as proposed under the new ordinance, and then a year went by with no violations, and then there was a new violation, and Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it would, again, start at that lowest level. But when, when the violations occur within a 12-month period, then they escalate. So because the citation structure is set up that way, that necessarily follows into the ordinance. So was there, when you met with people or talked among the staff group, did you talk about um, you know, increasing that to be you know, th three violations over any period of time? Or was that never discussed? I'm going to defer to Sherry. I don't believe we discussed it. But. So I did mention in some of our staff groups that certain jurisdictions, the, the, the longest I've seen is a 24-month period. Um, that doesn't mean that somewhere out there there's not something longer than that, but things change all the time. But based on my original research, there were some jurisdictions that would say three strikes within 24 months would have that same effect. But um, we, we ended up with 12 months. 
Thank you. And one last question. Um, I know that we've talked about the number of violations and the type of violations. Um, I would like to see a, some kind of a chart that shows, you know, the number of noise violations, the number of whatever, um, at some point. And if not for us, um, I think that'd be great to have for council. So oh, just we can certainly comment. make that available. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, Vice Chair Peterson. Yeah, yeah your, your question triggered another one for me. On the, on the transient occupancy tax issue, so is this all self-reported? How does the city know what the correct amount is? Yes, it's self-reported. Is there an audit power? I mean... I'm sorry, say that again? Is, is there an audit power? I mean, do you get to look at the books ever? Or is it, it's truly just, hey, here's how many nights I rented, here's the rate, and here's the calculation? There is a provision that they have to keep their receipts for three years, but as far as I know, we have never done an audit. What's the penalty for not keeping them for three years? Uh, and how would you know? Fines is my guess. Finance is really who would need to answer that, and unfortunately, uh, Mr. Alan Alton was not able to be here tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Cisco? Yeah, I was hoping to ask a question of our fire marshal, if he's here. I think he is <laughs> he on is Zoom. He is on Zoom, yes. Okay. Ready? Um, Mr. Lowenthal, uh, I noted that the bonfire um, possibility was eliminated. Could you let me know if there were other conversations about these other, um, like fire pits, recreational fires, like what the conversation was about that and why we have them available to uh, the STRs? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, Paul Lowenthal, Division Chief Fire Marshal. Um, so the the goal was to obviously to help reduce the risk associated with uh, the uh, occupants using uh, the facilities. Uh, we clearly defined uh, the different types of open burning they can do with uh, that type of um, material that readily burns. Uh, so we tried to break it into making it clear that there's permissible burning when you're using uh, propane or natural gas um, and then uh, what the potential is when you're using uh, wood or something that can spark. So we broke it down uh, and put rules in place uh, that separates uh, the fire pits, uh, the recreational fires from flammable vegetation, away from structures, so that there's clear uh, measures in place to again reduce the risk. The reason uh, that we eliminated the bonfires is because they are technically something that can be permitted uh, but with the size of a bonfire being over three feet in diameter and, and two feet in height, it puts it uh, out of a recreational fire into a bonfire. We just felt it was easier than really no reason for something uh, of that size uh, to take place. And again, just to, to do our part to make uh, the use safer. Um, we uh, did have discussions uh, that ultimately led to us putting the restriction on all uh, open flame burning uh, utilizing wood and, and whatnot uh, once the fire season is declared. And that would go in line with some of our other burning uh, bans that uh, go into effect during fire season uh, in the wildland urban interface. Um, and so hopefully it all just kind of ties in a lot easier. But no discussion about just eliminating all of those items as um, amenities for an STR just because of the fire danger. No, we felt with the measures that are in place, um, you know, obviously we're, we're open to any guidance or recommendations from um, from the commission and or council, but uh, with the, the verbiage and the wording that we put in place, uh, try to make it as, as safe as possible during the, the winter months. Uh, but essentially, once fire season is declared, those activities cease anyway, so it becomes a, a, a off-season uh, risk mitigation. Okay, great, thank you. Yes. Hello, Mr. Fire Marshal. Um, I wanted to ask, um, do you uh, regard uh, short-term rentals as a target hazard that needs special consideration in evacuation uh, scenarios uh, during a large-scale event? 
We do, uh, and that's why we put some of those uh, additional measures in place, including the ability to utilize uh, a landline at the facility for SoCo Alert, uh, the equivalent of our reverse 911 system, as well as the educational materials that uh, reflect the neighborhood travel routes, the evacuation zones, uh, and most importantly, the know your alerts. Uh, our goal is to make sure that the people that are using the short-term rentals have the information that they need in the event that we need to get it to them. The last thing we want is somebody to be utilizing uh, one of the short-term rentals and not be aware of what's occurring and then potentially be delayed in getting the notifications and or putting themselves or a neighbor in harm's way uh, by either evacuating or not evacuating when we need them to. Um, so hopefully, again, with uh, the measures that we have in place, it will help uh, provide a higher level of protection for the people utilizing uh, the short-term rentals and those uh, living around them. Thank you. So any other questions at this point from the commission? So I think we'll, we will take a five-minute break um, before we open the public hearing on this. So uh, if we could be back at 6.55, thank you.
Okay, we're going to get uh, started again with the meeting. Um, if you could please take your seat. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay, we're going to um, continue the meeting now. So at this time, um, I'm going to open the public hearing on this item. Um, but before I do, I want to make a couple of comments. Um, we're using speaker cards, the blue cards that were at the top. Um, so if you haven't filled one out and you wish to speak, please do so and give it to uh, the staff up there at the top. Um, because we have so many speakers present and on Zoom, we're going to limit the comments to two minutes rather than the customary three. Uh, the comments from in person will occur first and then uh, we'll take a break and then go to the Zoom comments. Um, Let's see. Um, I will call people in groups of three. So if you could make your way to the podiums at the top, that would be great. Uh, also, if you, if, please try not to repeat each other. Uh, if somebody speaks and they have a comment that you agree with, raise your hand or something like that. Um, but otherwise, uh, it, becomes very repetitive for everybody. Um, so with that, I will, as I said, go ahead and open the public hearing on this. Um, and oh, one thing I did want to mention for those of you who aren't familiar with um, public meetings, and um, when you make a public comment, we don't do back and forth. If you ask us a question, we won't answer it. Uh, we will be writing down your comments and your questions and when, public comment period is over, we bring it back to um, the commission, we'll have those comments and questions that you've asked to be able to um, ask staff and address those. So. so with that, as I said, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing on this. The first speaker is Chris Clark, followed by Skanda Viz Vizvanathan, and I'm sorry I'm but butchering names followed by Sarah Faulkner. And as you speak, if you could uh, say your name for the record. Sure. My name is Chris Henty Clark. Uh, I'm just gonna read an email to make it faster here. My I'm sorry, it was oh, Chris, Chris Clark, Clark was first. Oh, I'm Chris Henty Clark, I guess this guy. Okay. <laughs> so Chris Clark is first. Okay. Oh. Oh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll keep this short. My financial future is at stake here. It will take me many years to recover the investments I've made to my home so that it can support short-term rentals. How would any of you feel if that were you? And it's bigger than just me. It's about our city. I love our city. I love providing a place for families to stay when they visit. I've had people send me photos of their family in my backyard, all dressed in matching outfits, taking a photo for their Christmas cards. It warms my heart. These are people that want the amenities of a home, and if they can't stay in our city, they'll just go somewhere else. The impact is not titanic, but in a small way, my home helps local businesses. Are my, rest, are my guests filling up all the restaurants? No, of course not, but they're there. They buy gas in our gas stations, souvenirs from our shops, they buy food at our grocery stores and pay taxes that support our city's functioning. 
I'm speaking for the many who aren't here today, those that work in our economy and depend on its future. I would ask everyone here to make decisions that are good for the future of Santa Rosa and not allow the opinions of those who would exclude the people working in our, com our economy from the growth of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Skanda. Good evening. Um, I'm Skanda Viswanathan. You didn't butcher my name, so thank you. Um, my wife and I, we are retired citizens of Santa Rosa. We moved here from uh, San Jose in 2021. We sold our house in San Jose uh, because we had a huge mortgage. And we came here knowing that we would be having $2,000 of expenses every month, just property tax and fire insurance. We are not grandfathered in like a lot of people here are and uh, have low property taxes, but we took that because we were expecting to be able to do this short-term rental. Um, looking at it, we thought we could recover that and we could be able to do it in the time where we usually, for three or four months, we do travel uh, to outside, outside of the country because we have to take care of parents. And in that time frame, we would recover this cost. And unfortunately, we fell right into that hole between um, August 21 and uh, October or November 21 when these new regulations were put in place. And uh, we got just uh, zoned out by multiple permit holders who, who, who were allowed to apply before us. Uh, I was not allowed to apply until December 3rd, by which time I was done. There was no chance of applying anymore. So what's happening now is that we put all of our projects on hold. Um, we've stopped, at least I've, I've, I'm going to lose my deposit on my solar uh, energy system. And um, I think that we'll be putting our house in the market. And it's because I think that this is something which we shouldn't be doing or it's, it's not going to sustain our retirement. So thank you for hearing me out. And I think this thousand foot rule is a violation of my rights as a homeowner who has the right to do whatever I want. With thank my you. Home. Your time is up. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Faulkner. I'm going to read two quotes. We want to preserve the kind of neighborhoods where people know their neighbors where children can play in the streets, where there's stability and security. It would be most unfair to take people who've acquired homes and invested their life savings and suddenly say to them, you must now have people living next door who may be objectionable to you. While these quotes may feel familiar to you based on the statements here, they were made by those in the 1960s who opposed the Fair Housing Act, an act seeking to prevent discrimination in our neighborhoods. At their core, both of these issues are about who gets to live with, where and with whom. Opponents of short-term rentals often fear it will lead to an influx of people with different lifestyles, cultures, or socioeconomic backgrounds. The world is changing as it forever does, and the concept of where someone lives is changing too. People have many reasons to use short-term furnished residences as homes. This regulation tries to say that anyone living in a home for less than 30 days is a different group that can be regulated differently than the rest of us. When we create an other group, we're quickly able to dehumanize them. Like in this ordinance, the right um, against unreasonable search and seizure. In this regulation, the enforcers actually wrote the legislation of enforcement, giving them the crazy power to enter any home at any time for any reason or for no reason at all. How is this not a violation of the Fourth Amendment? How does it make sense to have one full-time dedicated code enforcement officer to target fewer than 169 citizens? If these regulations are for the safety and peace of the neighborhood, why is the code of conduct not expected of everyone? It's all too easy to carve out a group of others and take all of their rights away, and it shouldn't be. I purchased and set up a short-term rental a few months after the COVID shutdowns in 2020 when my company closed. I spent three full-time months and well over 100,000 in furnishings. I, a year later, purchased a second home. 
I've had zero complaints and zero life violations for these properties. And if I were to lose one of these homes, it would forever destroy the financial future of my family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next three are Marsha Shotwell, Eric Rail, and Gary Lentz. If you could make your way to the podium. So we'll start with Marsha Shotwell. Good evening. Um, I am the third generation of Santa Rosa here. My grandmother came here in the late 1800s. We I'm sorry, could you speak a little closer to the microphone? Oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Is that better? Yes, thank, thank you. you. I'm the third generation Santa Rosa in here. My, my grandparents came here in the 1800s, so we've lived here all these years, our whole family. Um, and now we have an Airbnb next door to us that has caused us nothing but grief, the noise. Um, thank goodness they made some rules. Before that, there was 16 people in the backyard drunk, playing cornhole, yelling, screaming, fighting with the neighbors. So I thank you, code enforcement, for that. But my other big concern is they've got a fire pit in the backyard underneath oak trees. We live on Manzanita. We haven't burned up yet. Then there's another fire pit right down the street on this little short Dodge Lane. Um, my concern is what happens when these fire pits, like the wind comes up at 3 o'clock every afternoon, and the leaves from the oak trees tumble down, fall into the fire pit, and say la vie. I, I think that there should be no fire pits. We went to Groveland for a wedding um, down by Yosemite. They don't allow fire pits. There's a stub there. They've taken all fire pits and barbecues out. I think that is a really smart thing to do, to keep from burning up neighborhoods. So I would really appreciate it if you consider taking all the fire pits out, at least in the wooded areas. It just makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric Rail. Good evening. My wife and I purchased our home in Fountain Grove in March of 2017. We lost it in the Tubbs fire. We rebuilt. Now we're surrounded on three sides by short-term rentals. Since we rebuilt, the five-bedroom house across the street from us was sold to a woman living out of state who converted it to a non-hosted STR. Shortly thereafter, the five-bedroom house next, next door to us was sold to a gentleman who owns two other houses in Sonoma County who immediately obtained a non-hosted STR permit. Finally, the five-bedroom house that shares our back fence was recently sold for $2 million, and the buyers obtained a hosted STR permit, asserting to the city that they will utilize the 4,600-square-foot main house as a hosted STR, why they will live in the 500-square-foot guest house. The current ordinance allows these three STRs to bring in a total of 30 renters each night and a total of 15 additional guests during the daytime for a grand total of 45 people with all the associated partying, loud music, and disturbances that create anxiety for my wife and me virtually every weekend. These renters don't respect the peace and tranquility of our neighborhood because they're just there for a good time for the weekend. All of this comes with the steady stream of gardeners, pool cleaners, repairmen, house cleaners, property managers, and the regular sound of beep, beep, beep at all hours of the day and night from the minibus used by the property managing, management company to shuttle their guests around. Some people talk about property rights <coughs> of STR owners in good standing, but what about the property rights of homeowners in good standing? This body and the city council has been made mistakes in the past. However, no one could have anticipated the damage that unrestrained growth of STRs would inflict upon our community. I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to correct those past mistakes and begin the process of undoing some of the damages that have occurred. Thank you. Your time is up. Uh, Gary Lentz. 
Hi, I'm going to talk to you about three things. One of them is a suggestion on grandfathering, sorry Sherry, uh, of people who have multiple rentals, uh, short-term rentals. The other is the tripling of fines and the possibility of bifurcating those fines. And the third thing is uh, un uh, uh, unlicensed operators in our city, which I think are the real scourge. So first of all, uh, short-term rental basically saved my financial life eight years ago. I was, uh, the, the Great Recession hit me very hard. I had young children still going through a bad divorce, underemployed for a number of years, and somebody turns me on to Airbnb, and it was a lifesaver. It helped, enabled me to save my home, uh, uh, save for college education for my kids, and I want to retire in the next few years, and now, now I have a chance to do that. Along comes this stink bomb in the middle of this revision that says one per owner. Well, now I'm lucky enough to have two, and that is a huge part of my retirement strategy. In fact, I don't have a pension, that's it. And somebody wants to make me give up one of them, good luck. I, I'm consulting every attorney I can because this is huge. So I want you to consider the people who've been operating in good faith not doing that to them. Secondly, the tripling of fines. Just yesterday or two days ago, I was given a fine for some wording that was unclear in one of my ads. By the way, a permit which was reinforced and re-given re to me just last month. And I'm told that uh, the, the language is wrong and I'm getting fined $500. Well, in a month, if this passes, it'll be $1,500. There should be two schedules, one for ministerial things like this, just like other code enforcement things. Noise is the big thing. That's what we're fighting. It's going to hear from everybody. Noise and parties, noise and parties. That can be a million dollars. I don't care. Good operators like me, eight years, hundreds and hundreds of guests, thousands of guests, no problems, no question whatsoever. So you're fighting the wrong enemy. If there's 350, as, as Ms. Mead said, of unlicensed in the city, that's who we should be going after. People like me who are following the rules, don't badger us with $1,500 for miswording ads. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next three are Jennifer Cogliando, Ch Charles, no last name, and Shane Hall. Hi, I'm Jennifer. And I There's a button on the side, um, so you can lower the... Oh, oh. I thought we had three minutes, so I'm going to try and make this shorter. Um, I've been a property manager for seven years in the Bay Area, um, and this allows me a lot of flexibility to help with my parents So, I, because I'm working at home. Um, in the past seven years, I have only had two parties under my watch out of 8,000 stays, and I have helped over 100 hosts and managed dozens of listings. Most guests are respectful. I have hosted guests for many different reasons. Everyone from grandparents coming to see their grandchild, patients coming to have a procedure done at one of our great hospitals, people coming for funerals, birthday parties, family reunions, to tour colleges, to see a sick friend, or to simply carry out their dream by visiting this beautiful area. Sometimes it's just good old relaxing girlfriend weekends outside the city that really heals the soul. Most guests are not coming here to party. Sonoma County is, always has been, and always will be a destination spot. I came up here for most of my growing years. My mother had a cabin in Casadero. My father had a place up in Tibra Cove, and eventually we all moved up here to stay. Don't ruin the dream for tourists who want to visit but don't want to stay in a motel room on Santa Rosa Ave. Let them live like a local for a weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Charles? Hi, my name is Charles. Uh, my feeling on the ordinance is those who already have a permit, if they have more than one, they should be able to keep it. Um, what I do like in the new ordinance is that the number of new permits uh, has a limitation, and it has to be a real person or a trust, and um, it would be nice if an LLC could be included as well. What is not fair is that my right to do this now takes away the right of my neighbor and everyone around me within a thousand feet, and only 198 permits are allowed in Santa Rosa. That hurts me 
because those two, those two limitations negative, negatively affect average folk in their time of need. Will a permit be available for them? In August of 2013, my partner retired from Cal Fire with post-traumatic stress disorder and decided to move to Hawaii. I was left to pay all the bills and support our son and my disabled nephew who lived with me. Renting my home short term helped me make ends meet in my time of need. Forward, I'm now 59 years old. My partner has moved back and we've never had an issue with our neighbors and my ability to rent my property short term is a part of my retirement plan. My dad's 96 years old and in a retirement community and those facilities are expensive. Sometimes people have to sell their homes to afford the cost of living in a care facility. But if people could rent their home or second home short term because an elderly couple doesn't always need long term care at the same time, that money could be used to help pay for their care. And if it's their primary home, that home will be theirs to return to in the event they get better or they enter hospice and need to return home because the facility can't care for them anymore. If they rented their home long term to earn income, they would have to wait 30 to 60 days after giving notice and people who enter hospice rarely have that long to wait. Limiting the number of new hosted non rental purpose a permit can have and it has to be a real person is enough. Don't create an ordinance where a neighbor, um, my right to do this now takes away the rights of my neighbors around me. And Thank there's you. only 198 lucky ones. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shane Hall. It will come back to him in case. Uh, the next three are Priscilla Bale. Ed Kinney and Tim DeLugo. So we'll start with Priscilla. My husband and I own a home in Bennett Valley. I want to acknowledge the Santa Rosa Code Enforcement staff and thank them for being very helpful and responsible to us before I begin my remarks. Uh, there's an unhosted short-term rental house directly behind our home. It's owned by a high net worth out-of-town couple who fitted the house out as an entertainer's paradise, and it's advertised as that. So last summer, every weekend day, every weekend evening, there were loud, raucous, disruptive parties right across the back fence from us. One renter sh shouted the F word over and over and over again. So we don't feel safe inviting our granddaughters who are 13 and eight over to our home on the weekends. The management company shut down the parties at 10 o'clock, but they keep renting the house over and over again to the same people and don't screen their tenants. So we don't feel secure in our home and our neighbor doesn't either. When I asked her, she's an elderly widow who lives by herself. I asked her to call the police at the last rowdy party and she said she was afraid. She was afraid of reprisals. Also, I think short-term rentals are, instead of bringing income and jobs to Santa Rosa, actually diminish our local economy. They remove homes from our desperate limited housing market and they reduce the value of the neighboring houses surrounding the short-term rental. Our realtor has told us that having a short-term rental has reduced the value of our house by at least 15 percent. There are six houses around our house so that's 15 percent reduction times six. If you multiply that by the 198 short-term rentals that's a multi-million dollar loss for Santa Rosa residents. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Ed Kinney. Yeah, hi, my name's Ed Kinney. Uh, I have uh, run successful Airbnbs and VRBOs for over 20 years with uh, no complaints other than uh, seem to have some broken 
uh, wine glasses and missing teaspoons. But in the, there's always going to be pros and cons here. People are going to have bad situations. Uh, the problem is, the question is how big is the problem? And I'm going to go kind of reflect on some of uh, Chairman, or I'm sorry, Mr. Sanders on the, on the right side down there. He was asking questions I thought were very poignant. How big, truly going like how big is the problem? Okay, so we've got 100, 198 Airbnb or non-hosted Airbnbs. Approximately 280 noise complaints. That's less than one per night. There was no data that was presented on how many renter nights are out there. So of those 280 noise complaints, how many renter nights was that over? I mean, it's less than one per night, uh, per unit. But when you, you, when you factor it down to renter nights, that number is going to be even less significant. Some gentleman over here, with the, he's surrounded by him. He's got a problem. I get that. Where do we go with that? Code enforcement. All right. The lady that just spoke, I talked with her before. Um, I, I feel her pain. I get it. She's, and she has said that she has called code enforcement numerous times and she doesn't get any reaction. Why can't we, if I'm pro VRBOs, okay, I'm pro for this thing, but I want to keep my business going and I want code enforcement to take control if there's a problem so that we can keep this system alive and not make people like her suffer. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Tim DeLugo. Thank you. Okay, uh, some of the points that I had to make have been asked already, so I'll, I'll make it really brief. Um, I'm hearing a lot of, uh, you know, with the new proposed uh, codes and ordinance, um, it, it, there's a lot of one size fits all, and I just kind of want to put some things on the table. I have a NMU unit downtown. It could be a state farm building tomorrow. It could be a restaurant. I've got a restaurant next to me. I've got a Memorial Hospital down the street. I've got uh, you know, a CPA across the street. Um, two back neighbors are businesses. And I do have a short-term rental right next door to me. We help each other you know, keep an eye on things. I've never had a complaint. I've never had a party. And I've operated this for three years. But the fact that my neighbor is less than a thousand feet away, that could pose a problem in the future, I'm, I'm assuming. And again, these are NMU mixed use, you know, properties. So I think the one size fits all is not, you know, it's not going to work very well. We have to have some consideration into where it's located and, and how we address this thousand feet. Um, and I think that's, oh, and the other is, the kind of guests that I've had, and I'm sure this is a similar story for, for many of us, I've got people coming from Germany, I've got uh, people coming from England, uh, you know, they're just visiting the area. And uh, these aren't, you know, I don't have the party type. Not to say it, it couldn't happen, but it hasn't happened. And if I did, my neighbor who's the restaurant next door probably wouldn't have such a problem as much as noise that goes on in that restaurant as well. I don't have a problem with that either. But uh, the Memorial Hospital, I find that I'm, I'm hosting to a lot of uh, people that are here for triage relatives that are right down the street. So that's a whole other thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Sheila Lawrence, followed by Marie Piazza, followed by Maureen Lind. If you could state your name for the record uh, when you get to the podium. And you can go to either podium, either side. Okay, my name is Sheila Lawrence. And uh, you're not really going to get an argument from me because I actually think both sides are right. I think the problem lies uh, with the system. Uh, the, the vacation rental owners have a right to expect that they can go ahead and rent their property short term along the, with the guidelines that Sonoma County set out. 
what I see with these um, amendments is they're clawing some things back and they're putting some things out there that are next to impossible to, uh, to reach that go those goals. Uh, the homeowners themselves have an absolute right uh, to the quiet enjoyment of their home. So you have, you have property rights on both sides, they're different. And we don't need to create losers in order to have winners. Uh, we can have both sides win. These uh, uh, amendments show me a lack of sufficient uh, understanding of the business of vacation rentals and um, how much time, effort, and money it takes to set one up and to run one. And um, I think that the, the, the sound and the fire hazards can be enforced, and I think that code should be an enforceable one, and people should call, be able to call the police with a reasonable expecta expectation that they will come out and that, uh, uh, you know, this will have an impact on the vacation rental, or at least a notice or something, so that they know that if they get three strikes, they're out. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marie Piazza, and um, we have one right next door to us, short-term rental, which is a nightmare. But I want to talk to you a little bit more with some data about existing short-term rental supply and that it is adequate to meet perceived needs. Um, the, what I'm hearing is that the short-term rentals are necessary for visiting nurses, temporary construction workers, fire evacuees, actors, and others. And I say there's already enough. There's adequate transient accommodations to fulfill these perceived needs. In fact, the Sonoma County Coalition of Hosts website says that there's currently 1,873 short-term rental permits within the county. Okay. In his presentation to the Board of Supervisors at their July 20, 21 meeting, Brian O. of Permit Sonoma estimated that there's nearly 3,000 short-term or vacation rentals within the county. I think it's fair to say that within the county there's already between two and 3,000 short-term rentals. Of these, many are located a short distance from the city limits of Santa Rosa. A quick search on Airbnb and VRBO websites revealed that there's 200 plus listings of short-term rentals within a 15 minute drive of the city limits of Santa Rosa. And in addition to these, there's numerous hotels and motels within the city limits. This combination of short-term rentals and existing commercial rentings is more than adequate, and we don't need to put these in our residential neighborhoods, where basically we have a revolving door hotel with no supervision. A behavior that would never be allowed in a motel or hotel, parties, loud noise, excessive parking, is allowed to happen in our residential neighborhoods. And the fact that I have to disclose when I go to sell that there's a short-term rental next door, that says that this is a negative impact on the neighborhood along with you'd have to uh, reveal that you had a violent episode in your house, right? Thank you. Thank you. Maureen Lind, followed by Larry LaPere. Hi, my name's Maureen Lindy. I live right next door to a non-hosted short-term rental. The short-term rental has four bedrooms and a pool. It is very close to our side yard abutting our primary bedroom and office. The current rules allow up to eight overnight, overnight guests and an additional four daytime guests. Rental rules do not allow events but eight to 12 people in a yard using foul language, screaming, splashing, drinking, loud music, etc., from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. is just as disruptive as any event. The groups that come to this house are not here to walk their dogs, visit a park, or go to the farmer's market. They are here to party and get the most bang for their buck. We have had fighting, cars peeling out. We've had uh, Ubers, Lyft, wine vans, DoorDash use our driveway to turn around. Guests have come to our door late at night looking for the Airbnb. They bring their dogs to leave them out barking all day long. The list goes on and on. It has become difficult for my husband to conduct business in his office when this home is occupied. To try to defuse the noise, we keep our windows and patio doors closed. This is not a neighbor. 
This is a business. This is not a regular neighbor activity. The couple that owns this home does not even live here. They don't care that we are inconvenienced or woken up at three in the morning. They don't care that the dogs are barking or lights are left on throughout the night glaring into our bedroom. What they care about is their bottom line, which is to make as much money off of this property as possible. It is disappointing that the city is allowing a business to operate next to a home that once provided peace and solitude. When you, when you live next to a short-term rental, every guest is a bad actor. It doesn't matter how many rules you implement or contact names and numbers you provide, the bottom line is that my husband and I are the ones policing this business. Would you want this next to you? Would you be thank, as patient? Thank you. Oh, darn. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Larry LaPierre. Yeah, hi. My name is Larry LaPierre. Uh, I own a short-term rental on the north side of town. Before the doors were open, I I had a very gracious conversation with two ladies. I'm sorry. Could you sp could you speak into the microphone? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. That's thank you. All right. I had a gracious conversation with two ladies who were um, opposed to vacation rentals, and their number one complaint is the, lo the loud nuisance parties. I get it. No, I totally understand. I'm on the same page with you. As a host, as an owner, I don't think there is a single owner in this room right now who says, yeah, frat parties, that's where the money is. No, we hate the parties. Airbnb hates the parties. They are aggressive. They have an algorithm that looks for anybody who could possibly have a party and they totally reject their offer and their request to stay. I look at this, Senate, or Council Member Sanders, you asked what is our uh, policing policy? I don't know if I can talk about everybody, but in 50 seconds I can tell you kind of what I do. Um, it starts with me. I set myself up on Airbnb. I have, uh, you cannot rent or you cannot uh, request booking if you have no ratings. You have to have at least a 4.0 rating or higher. Otherwise, I have to approve you. Um, then I look at um, who you are. Uh, if you've gone through the algorithm, you're probably okay. If you're there, I've worked with all my neighbors. I've got uh, approval from my neighbors that they would uh, call me if there's any problems. If they call me, I'm over there. I knock on the door and I say, hey, knock it off. And if they don't go with that, I call Airbnb. I let them know there's a resource line. And if that doesn't work, then I get a hold of law enforcement and I would stop it. But my primary goal is to stop the party Thank you. or whatever at that time. Thank you. Uh, Eric Dietz, followed by Cynthia Hermosillo, followed by Bernadette Burrell. All right, well, commissioners, uh, you've heard testimony from STR owners uh, telling us that they need the income for their, from their non-hosted short-term rentals to make ends meet. And I empathize you know, that some people need to generate extra income to afford living here. We, we all know this is an expensive place to live. But we're less sympathetic towards individuals who operate short-term rentals merely because they can generate a greater profit than renting on a long-term basis. We believe that the number of owners who truly need the additional income is small compared to the number of owners who are just operating short-term rentals on a purely commercial basis. And there are alternatives. The most obvious answer is to rent out the same property on a long-term lease. You know, this would be much less disruptive for the neighbors that live around the property. And more importantly, if current uh, 198 non-hosted SDRs were converted to long-term rentals, it would instantly add to Santa Rosa's available housing stock. I think you all heard from Sherry Meads that if a new subdivision came in with 198 units, that that would be a big thing. People would be excited about it. Now, I can speak from personal experience that this is a viable solution. You know, my wife and I own a rental home. 
in Santa Rosa, and it's been a win-win. It's provided income for us, and it's provided a home for a family in Santa Rosa that lives and works here. All right, so now suppose you live next to an STR, a non-hosted one like I do. You know, what, what are your options? You know, you can continue living next to a nuisance, and um, thank you, Mr. Lou Kirk, you've, you've come out to help um, on the STR that's next to us, so I appreciate your help. Uh, but it requires us to act as partners in enforcing the code, so we actually have to do this because we happen to live next to one. Or we could move away, but you know, then we'd have to disclose to a potential buyer that we live next to an STR, and that's gonna depress the property values. Thank you. Cynthia Hermosillo. Hello, um, my name, I wish to remain anonymous, but it was already said, and the reason why is because the city has decided to mail out 150 letters in my name, and I already got uh, two hate phone calls for establishing my home as a short-term rental. So I just wanted to let you know part of your coding enforcement is not working out perfectly. The couple of families called to wish my family the worst of luck and uh, our bad, it's just bad luck on us and how horrible we are as people to uh, have our home as a short-term rental. Anyways, I'm here to astou I'm here to tell you that the amount of short-term rentals that are in Santa Rosa is obviously less than 1%. It shows it on your records, it shows it on your slides, and thank you for Terry for pointing that out. Less than 1% is zero. It's zero percent. And if I'm here at every city council meeting possible that I've been in the past, I've heard, I've heard four homes that probably need to be um, not allowed to do short-term rentals anymore. Out of zero percent, we're here all night long, every time fighting for our rights. I think the city should do a better, much better at using your so-called code enforcements and your city officials to reduce the amount of parties um, I don't know what you're doing with our tax dollars. I don't know what you're doing with the so-called city officials that have claimed to be there for party purposes. I have never had a party at my house, and I think that you should uh, decline people who have had parties. Thank you. Thank you. Bernadette Burrell, followed by Rick Abbott. I have two STRs that border my property. One is a hosted, the other is a non-hosted. The hosted has never been a problem. This is a couple that built an apartment above their garage to host people and supplement retirement. Next to me is an investor-owned non-hosted for the sole purpose of maximum return on the investment, also known as a great place for a large group, according to their website. Lou Kirk, with his best intentions, but because of the lack of enforcement prior to him coming on board, all the violations that were submitted for for nine months was dismissed. For 16 months, the STR next to me advertised for six bedrooms. The assessor's record said it was a four bedroom. During that time, the city essentially coached the applicant to help them discover how to properly complete their application before it was finally issued a permit with a courtesy notice sent to neighbors. Nothing done for false or misleading information on their um, permit. During the same 16 months, 16 months period that that city was assisting the applicant and despite numerous complaints by neighbors for noise disruptions at all hours of the night and over occupancy by overnight guests, this operator in good standing was allowed to do whatever they please with little to no penalty. They were allowed to resubmit plans after 16 months. This did not result in a violation, but a fixed ticket. The city of Santa Rosa needs to eliminate non-hosted STRs from residential zoning. We are not NIMBYs, we are residents that do not want non-conforming transient housing next to us. It is absolute insanity to live next to a non-hosted short-term rental and call the hotline, call the managers and basically manage the hotel. Why are we, the members of the community, send our kids to school here, volunteer, donate, and vote here, forced to live next to transient occupancy? 
hotels. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Rick Abbott, followed by Chris Hentley Clark. Good evening, Rick Abbott, my wife and I, Sharon, have lived in this town for 45 years. Numerous signs in the gallery contend that STRs are a boon to our economy. I'd like to argue the opposite. Surveys have shown that up to 98% of visitors will still come to an area even if there were non-hosted STRs within that area. They would simply stay in other accommodations. That means they would still eat at our restaurants, visit our wineries, shop in our stores, and do all that visitors normally do. So there would be minimal loss of tourism by eliminating all non-hosted STRs from Santa Rosa's residential areas. Those STRs could then house permanent residents who would add their own economic benefit to that of the tourists staying in our hotels. This combination of permanent residents in our residences and visitors in our hotels would provide a greater economic benefit than transient occupants staying part-time in our residence. So non-hosted STRs are a drain on our economy and not a benefit. Someone asked about a cost-benefit analysis. The city generates somewhere in the neighborhood of a million and a half dollars annually in TOT and BIA. If you consider the loss of property value for all the surrounding homes on that non-hosted short-term rental, the 198 homes have 1,584 surrounding homes. If each one of those homes is devalued by $10,000, that's a devaluation of $15 million. The cost benefit of 1.5 million versus $15 million is pretty clear. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Henty Clark, yes. followed by Sean Hermosillo. Yes. Uh, my wife and I own three properties in Santa Rosa, with three of which are non-hosted permits. Uh, we wanted to let you know how becoming short-term rental hosts has changed our lives and how significantly capping the number of non-hosted permits would affect the future we plan for ourselves and our two children. We're asking you to please not cap the number of non-hosted permits or at least to allow flexibility to transfer each permit into someone else's name on the current title of the property. We all know Sonoma County has a very high cost of living and it can be hard to have a stable financial future here, even with two parents working full-time middle income jobs. I've worked as a PT assistant for 12 years and my wife has worked as an occupational therapist for eight. We've been Sonoma County residents for many years. We purchased our homes in Santa Rosa uh, in 2019, 2021, and 22. We've invested much of our extra time, lots of money into preparing our units to be beautiful, useful, well-organized places for people to stay. We've also been able to keep long-term renters in one of our houses well under market value. They live in a two-bed, one-bath house at 1900 a month, which is well under the current market value. Um, we employ a local mom. She's our only, our only cleaner, and she also helps us with managing. She puts her kids in day daycare. We pay her $50 an hour, which is a very fair wage. Um, it's, it's been a huge benefit for us. We're hoping to put our kids through college with this. We're hoping to continue allowing me to work part-time so I can be home with my, my youngest son there when he's off school. Um, that was a big blessing this year. Uh, no aftercare at his school, so I would have had to quit my full-time job. Um, luckily, that worked out. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Hermosillo, followed by Dan Gunino followed by Fairman Escusha. Hello, my name is Sean Hermosillo. Um, I'm 48 years old, native to Sonoma County, born in Santa Rosa. My dad was a cop in San Francisco. My mom uh, was born in Hillsburg, and we had a board and care home for the mentally ill for 45 years on Cherry Street. I'm now a real estate agent for eight, the past 18 years after going to the JC. I have two little boys, and my first house, 
um, after I had a condo, we turned into an Airbnb slash four bedrooms total. Two were rented out long term. And then we had traveling individuals come and visit while I was convincing my wife to marry me traveling back and forth between Santa Monica. After that, we bought another home, moved into it. After we moved out of it, we turned it into a short-term rental, non-hosted. We now have three permits, and I've been a member of the community, did FFA, 4-H, left Sonoma County, came back, and this is part of how um, we pay for our life, right? Uh, we've had over 800 visitors between the three homes that we do rent and the other 20 properties that my wife helps manage with me helping her. In addition to the real estate market, I have not seen a single buyer say I'm not buying that house because it's next to a short-term rental. Um, there needs to be regulation. Anybody who's a, a bad behaving individual or owner, they need to be penalized. and. From what I heard, the council asked some great questions. Eight complaints since this ordinance has been put in place, that's really good. And I don't even think there's enough data points to show how well this ordinance is working. So please make it make sense. Take away the people's rights that are misbehaving because I want a quiet community. This is my community. And everybody you. deserves that right to have quiet enjoyment of their home. Thank you. Dan Gunino. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. I'm Dan Gunino representing Wine Country Getaway, and I would like to discuss the challenges of poorly managed short term rentals and how to ensure that Santa Rosa can benefit from this industry. As a certified professional vacation rental manager, I oversee several properties in Sonoma County. While I understand the concerns of neighbors who have high faced disruptions due to short-term rentals, it is important to differentiate between amateur and professional operators in this market. With access to technical solutions such as cloud recording outdoor cameras, indoor-outdoor noise sensors, guest screening, and security deposits, we can prevent and address issues like noise parking, parties, and trash. By implementing best pra management practices, short-term rentals can be conducted responsibly and respectfully while addressing neighborhood concerns. The vacation rental industry has been disrupted by web-enabled technologies, and with the evolution of technology, more solutions will emerge and new instances will decrease. Therefore, I urge you to consider the following steps to ensure that Santa Rosa can benefit from the great opportunity that vacation rentals can bring. To start, my first recommendation is to impose hefty fines on rug operators in order to ensure that they are stripped of their permits. We cannot allow them to view a fine as a mere expense of running their business. This approach will enable professional vacation rental managers and law-abiding homeowners to continue their operations while providing relief for those who have had to endure poorly managed properties. Secondly, we should ask major online travel agencies to collect a TOT tax mandatory. Moving on to the third point, I propose that we decouple the requirement for parking spaces from the number of rooms on a property, particularly in downtown areas where off-street parking can be scarce. Instead, I suggest that we limit the number of on-street parking spots to, to one permit, uh, to one per address permit, and, ha and leave the responsibility of parking arrangements to be managed between hosts and guests. Finally, I recommend, I propose a hybrid license that permits primary homeowners to render homes for a maximum 90 nights. This approach can be advantageous to homeowners who wish to preserve their homes in the event of job loss, produce additional income, or retirees who travel Thank in you. the summertime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fairman Escusha. Okay. Fairman. Oh, left. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Ted. Ted Anastat, followed by Mike Bryant, followed by Daniel Gill. Hello, my name is Ted Onestead, and I uh, co-own and co-manage a property management company that specializes in short-term rentals in Sonoma County. Um, I think that it's important whenever we have two polar opposites um, opinions 
to look to form a compromise and not point fingers at what things are, are right or wrong on the other side, but come to an agreement together. And I think that's what's best uh, for the community. And so I'm going to talk about a couple uh, changes that I think we can make to the ordinance uh, that might help um, from the standpoint of someone who's actually running these and managing all, these all the time without any complaints. Our goal is not to have any parties. We don't want any noise. Um, we want to have our houses blend into the, the neighborhoods just like uh, your neighbors that you like. Um, and so uh, let's go with uh, the main concern for SDRs is noise and partying. I think there's two easy ways to remedy this. Um, one, require a two-night minimum. People coming for just one night, we have we found, uh, pose a problem. They're coming to party. We have a two-night minimum in all our properties. It almost eliminated any noise right off the bat. Um, two, propose a fine for the violators that are actually coming to the property and making the noise. Um, just like someone gets, gets a speeding ticket, you can write them a ticket for making the noise of the property and make it mandatory for these uh, for the host to actually advertise that. When someone sees that they could get a violation or a fine of $1,000, $1,500 for visiting a, a property and partying, it's easy to actually look the other way or, or look for a different place to stay. Um, I think that we have uh, just like we had operators in good standing were omitted from the 1,000-foot rule when that was first put into place. I think there was only 25 property owners that own more than one property. I think we should look at those operators in good standing the same way and allow uh, property owners to have more than one short-term rental in the area. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. you. Uh, Mike Bryant. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for your uh, uh, time this evening. I appreciate it. Can you um, please yeah. talk into the mic? Okay. Can you hear me better? Yes, I'll, I'll thank in. you. Yeah. Oh, it's going to raise, okay. My name is Mike Bryant, and I've lived in town here with my wife uh, for 44 years, raised our family here. I uh, heard the percent of 1% and 0 to 1% of the uh, housing market being uh, at issue here. But if you live across a backyard fence where there's a seven-bedroom home, and that's going to be a party house. And that's 100% for those that live next door to one, not 1%. And I do know that the, the surveys that were conducted, uh, I appreciate the fact that input from the community was sought. Uh, but those surveys indicate that most people do not favor non-hosted short-term rentals in the neighborhoods. They should be restricted to uh, commercial uh, districts. I haven't met anybody that would uh, feel that my backyard has been improved or uh, if I wanted to sell it that the, uh, the value of my property has been enhanced by the fact that I've got a short-term rental next door. The um, hope is that the 198 will be the top end and that as those units uh, expire, we, we don't replace them. And I do hope that the uh, commission will listen to the community and respond to the voice that came out in the surveys. The majority of people are not in favor of residential communities having non-hosted short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Gill. Hello, my name is Daniel Gill. I am a local real estate agent and also a co-owner of a local vacation rental management company that we manage properties throughout Sonoma County. And we currently manage seven homes in, within the city limits of Santa Rosa. Um, I had a lot I wanted to talk about tonight, but I, I want to just kind of touch on some specific issues brought up um, by, by some of the individuals that are here tonight. Real quick, um, in terms of the comments on um, how STRs are, are in one way or the other, destroying your property value. So I, I pulled some numbers here um, from Barry's MLS, all from March 1st on, so very current data. Barry's MLS is where about 99% of, of sales take place, residential sales take place in Santa Rosa. And so here, real quick, are just some numbers to share. Um, home sales are up 44% from the previous month. Average price per square foot is up 7.8% from the previous month and up 1.9% from the previous year this same month. Average days on market is down 19%, showing that homes that hit the market are selling fast. 
And then lastly, supply of inventory is down 36% over month, 25% from last year, showcasing that there is not a mass exodus out of this city due to the presence of STRs. So those are just some facts to, to, to I think, um, respond to some of the emotion-based argument. And then um, I'd also like to just really quickly touch on the, the party house, because clearly that's a big issue here. And I have some things I wanted to say, but um, Chairman Sanders asked if a property management company could share some of their practices on what they do to limit parties. And so real quick, some of the things that we do as a company to limit parties, number one, we exclusively market our properties on Airbnb, because they have a two-way uh, two rating system. If we have a guest that parties, we can tag them to no longer um, allow them to stay at our homes, and future uh, hosts will see that they are a problematic guest. We communicate, um, we communicate with our guests on at least three occasions before they check in to describe our no party policy. We have cameras installed along the perimeters of our home to monitor parking and also monitor noise. And we engage our neighbors to make sure they have direct numbers to call when things escalate. Um, we have a two day minimum Thank as Tim mentioned. And we also have a 24 hour, we have an employee that is available 24 seven, 365 days a year to deal, with, to deal with complaints. Thank you. David Long followed by Joe Romano, followed by Vladin Timur. Good evening, commissioners. My name is David Long. I have lived in Santa Rosa for the past 35 years, and I appreciate the opportunity for you to hear me speak in person this evening. Thankfully, no mask. Internet-based platforms like Airbnb make it possible for anyone to offer and rent their residential property for short-term enjoyment by anyone. Being possible does not make it a good idea. In fact, these platforms simply provide the means for short-term rentals to operate in an autonomous atmosphere. This presents the city and its residents monumental problems, and these problems are bound to continue unless the frequency and or duration of non-hosted rental operations are reduced. Every non-hosted rental negatively impacts at least six neighbors. I am thankful that staff have made recommendations for changes to the short-term rental ordinance that will improve the current situation. Contrary to claims by non-hosted rental proponents, their business enterprise, enterprises are not essential to our community and are not compatible with residential neighborhoods. Staff also provided very weak examples of in-home occupations to try and justify zoning code consistency. Although the city is moving methodically to create reasonable regulations for short-term rentals, it made one critical misstep early in the process. The urgency ordinance contains an overly broad list of zoning districts where non-hosted rentals are allowed to operate. That list includes seven of the eight residential zoning districts and encompasses about 88% of the total land area within the city's boundaries. No other land use in the zoning code enjoys anywhere near that amount of latitude and neither should non-hosted short-term rentals. Santa Rosa is a well-rounded community where people live, work, raise children, go to school, and grow to know one another. We are not a resort town that depends on tourism to survive. Please make choices that benefit our community Thank rather you. than a few enterprising individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Romano. get my phone to cooperate. Uh, my name is Joe Romano. I've lived in Santa Rosa since 1968. I own a 7,000 square foot STR in the second district and I'm also the president of a group called STRAA team which is Short-Term Rental Advocates Association. Uh, it's uh, pretty difficult to uh, beat some of the concerns of the people here. You can see that many of them have big financial problems not being able to operate their SDRs. In my situation, this is a large nine bedroom house with 7,000 feet of deck, a swimming pool, a hot tub, all that. It is an entertainment palace. I've actually had more trouble with long-term tenants paying five-figure a month rent 
than I have short-term rental guests. Uh, most of our guests are corporate companies doing training, personnel bonding sessions, uh, bachelorette parties are good, and actually the bachelorette parties are the quietest guests you could ever get. Uh, we're going to be losing a contract with a major corporation that was renting space from us for 180 days a year, guaranteed. They actually paid for some of the remodeling to get the facility the way they wanted it. But the deal breaker for them is they will not sign any agreement on guest limits. They think if they're going to rent the space, if they want 40 people there, they should get them there. They also cannot agree to bedroom limits because one of the things they do is they take their top employees, they send them to an SDR to take their families on a vacation. They pay for the whole thing, including catering, bus transportation, all of that stuff. And uh, in meetings with them, it's just a deal breaker. They're not going to put their employees through that and they're paying top dollar for these spaces. They don't do it in hotels for safety Thank you. reasons. All right, I hope you will consider turning this down. Thanks. Latin Temir, followed by Christopher Kane, followed by Luke McGarva. Good evening, I'm Vladen Temer. I live in Santa Rosa, District 4. I've been a Santa Rosa resident for 45 years and I've lived in my present home for more than 40 years. As you look around the room, you will see on display two distinct sets of signs. The signs reading homes, not hotels, are all being held by residents of Santa Rosa. Those residents have been actively engaged for the past two years with Santa Rosa City staff and City Council with the goal of reclaiming neighborhoods from the nuisance of non-hosted short-term rentals. The other set of signs has been sponsored by the Sonoma County Coalition of Hosts. As we all suspect from the name Sonoma County, those signs are being displayed primarily by people who do not live in Santa Rosa. This is the same organization that rallied its members to appear before the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors and the Windsor Town Council to push their agenda of increasing the numbers of non-hosted short-term rentals within all areas of the county. Rather than being concerned residents attempting to protect their neighborhoods, these folks are primarily commercial business owners driven exclusively by their business interests. They are effectively outsiders attempting to impose their vision of short-term rentals everywhere while seeking to maximize their profits. I urge you all to pay attention to the different agendas of these two groups as you listen to and evaluate the statements that you are hearing today. Through the city's own surveys, residents have consistently stated that we do not want non-hosted short-term rentals in our residential neighborhoods. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to please honor the wishes of those of us who are your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher Kane. Hello, I'm Christopher Kane. Can, can you speak into the microphone, please? Absolutely. Is that a little bit better? That's much better. Thank Great. you. Great. Uh, my name is Christopher Kane. My family and I have resided in Santa Rosa for the past nine years. I retired last year as an executive after 37 years of service with Hewlett Packard, Agilent, and then Keysight Technologies. Non-hosted short-term rentals located within residential neighborhoods likely provides an economic benefit to the owner but that comes at a substantial impact to neighboring long-term residents. I have witnessed firsthand my neighborhood negatively impacted with higher traffic at all hours of the day and night, increased speeding on our narrow and twisting neighborhood roads, parking that blocks access to residents and emergency vehicles, increased litter, especially liquor bottles, excessive noise, wood burning, and offensive language. Not all short-term rental tenants create these issues, but more and more of them are using a short-term rental to let loose and party since they don't live here. 
our neighborhood increasingly is feeling more like downtown San Francisco, filled with transients that don't care about our family-oriented lifestyle, and that has been putting our safety at risk and eroding tax-paying residents' quality of living. My family and I are giving serious thought to living elsewhere, where we can again enjoy a high quality of living in a beautiful, quiet, diverse, and friendly neighborhood. I know the city has received a number of surveys from residents who have consistently stated we do not want non-hosted short-term rentals in our neighborhoods. Please honor the wishes of your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Luke McGarva, followed by Jeff Bean. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Luke McGarva. I am a longtime Santa Rosa resident. I've been here for over 40 years. I er, uh, currently own my home of 12 of those years, and I've been living next to an SCR for close to three years. Uh, you know, we purchased our home with the expectation that the current zoning laws would pre preserve our neighborhood, uh, and that's changed. Um, you know, a couple things I want to address. A lot. Of, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> a lot of it already has been addressed. Um, but the key difference between the short-term rentals and the other allowable uh, businesses within residential areas is supervision. Uh, while it was mentioned it's not required to have supervision on site for those type of businesses, the nature of those businesses, in fact, for the most part, would guarantee that. Uh, now when you have uh, folks that don't live in our neighborhoods coming in you know, every weekend, they are less concerned. You know, they're after one thing, which is to have a good time, and I can appreciate that. You know, all of our neighbors, we like to have people over at times. But it's the frequency and consistency of every single weekend having new people next door that you can't go talk to. You know, you're worried how they're going to react. And, uh, you know, now we're closing our windows, can't go outside. You know, it's constant nose pollution coming into our house. We're within 20 feet of this stuff going on. And it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the daytime. And the problem with the enforcement is it has to be at night. So what happens between 9 and 9 o'clock? You have a constant activity going on at loud noises every you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, it just gets to be exhausting, and your anxiety goes up, and it's affecting your family life, and it just becomes a huge problem. Um, you know, we're considering moving ourselves, but then, of course, you know, disclosure of STRs and the risk of who wants to live next to one of these things uh, is definitely prevalent. So please consider the impact to you know, all these individuals here that have these next to us now and the possibility of that increasing, causing problems and tensions in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Bean. Hi, Jeff Bean. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of uh, Santa Rosa. I live in the McDonald Historic District. Next door, the home was a traditional rental when we moved in. It was rented by drug addicts who were up late fighting and arguing. It took the owner about four months to get them evicted. We had the opportunity to buy that house, a 765 square foot home, so we could have peace and quiet next door. We turned it into an STR, and we've had many of our neighbors using the STR to host their visiting relatives. We are right next door, a mere 20 feet from the adjacent house, yet we're classified as non-hosted. Um, there's no one who wants peace and quiet at that STR more than my wife and I do. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Is there any, that's the end of the cards. Is there anybody else who would like to speak who didn't fill out a card? Okay, seeing no one, um, we do have some uh, people on Zoom, but we are going to be taking a 15-minute break right now um, and then come back and take the comments from Zoom and then uh, go into our deliberations. So with that, um, we'll be back about, what is that, what's 15 and 10? <laughs> 825, thank you.
Are you ready to go? Okay. Um, do you need to uh, recall the roll? Okay. So um, we're back in session, and we will now move to um, commenters on Zoom. If you are on Zoom and want to make a comment, please raise your hand, and you will be um, asked to unmute and called upon. So with that, the first, yes. Maria Wistalski. Um, I'm going to give you a prompt to unmute yourself. Please state your name for the record. And as a reminder, uh, it is two minutes. My name is Maria Ustalski. My name is Maria Ustalski. I am from Europe, from communist country, and I came here to so have better life. And. Uh, Please keep short-term rental, and I make an income from short income, and I support my family, and I feel comfortable here. And that way, I I can live a beautiful country. Anyway, I have it will forest me to to leave the Sonoma County, and I support that family because, of course, of the short-term rental. Please keep the short rental around. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Please state your name for the record. Hello, my name is Amanda Hagar. I am the owner and operator of two non-hosted short-term rentals in the city of Santa Rosa. I want to see fair legislation that supports the majority of short-term operators, as well as our neighbors, and focuses on stopping serious infractions like parties <clears throat> and noise, and not small infractions like that don't impact the community in any significant way, like an individual holding their home in an LLC they own 100% of. Currently, the income I receive from these parties is income my family and I rely heavily on. When I was told that I would potentially be losing one of my two permits, both of which are in good standing. I became very fearful as this would be a devastating financial loss. I had no idea that something was even legal. The process of maintaining and now fighting to maintain these permits has been a stressful and frustrating process. It continues to be a fight that's seemingly never ending and stacked against us by the very vocal minority. The majority of short-term rental owners and operators are good, hardworking people that included their property in their long-term financial plan, including their retirement. To have a governing body be able to take away a lifetime of hard work with one vote is unimaginable to me. I ask the council please consider how their actions will devastate these citizens. In addition to voting no to taking away valid permits by limiting to one per person, I ask that the strike system be amended to include a punishment that fits the infraction and add warnings for non-egregious offenses. My fellow hosts are having to pay hefty fines for things like allowing two daytime guests versus the higher number the city allows are not writing verbatim, no amplified noise versus no loud noise in their listings. Such minor infractions should come with a warning and not a hefty $1,500 fine and strike. Finally, arguing that short-term rentals are impacting our housing stock is just not supported by the facts. The likelihood that these homes are coming back on the market as an affordable primary rental is just very low. Thank you. Thank you. Carl Rashad, I'm going to send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Please state your name for the record. Hello. <clears throat> Pardon. My name is Carl Yeager, Carl Rashad Yeager. I bought my unhosted short-term rental so that my parents, as they age, and they are, they're 87 and 88, could eventually move to Santa Rosa and be near us so that we could care for them. And it was a way for me to afford to purchase this home and have some income until they're ready to make that move. And that move is happily, sadly imminent. I think we can all agree that really good, strong legislation that centers around noise, nuisance, and safety 
makes a lot of sense. So let's focus on that. Make them real, make them harsh. Most hosts do it well. I ran a short-term rental in a condominium in SF where we shared walls with others, not one single complaint, over six years. We hosted a nurse in our house in Santa Rosa, and we had neighbors on our doorstep shouting at her that she is not welcome here. She was a nurse of color, caring for people during COVID and saving lives. I think the families whose lives, whose family members she saved would welcome her here. When you have someone standing on your doorstep yelling at your guest, that just is not a good thing. So I would say that we need to have sensible legislation. We need to tone down the rhetoric and we need to deal with actual data of what are the noise and nuisance complaints, not all the rhetoric that I'm hearing tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Frazier, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, this is Eric Frazier and I'm at truthintourism at gmail.com. Happy to join my community to discuss this important topic. Uh, I do have a WC Fields quote to start off with. If you can't dazzle them with brilliance, you baffle them with, and I wanna get on to Shari Mead's comments here because there's a lot of things that are defective in today's presentation. For instance, she didn't mention that there's already a three property cap in place, why not? I mean. We're being jerked around, quite frankly. Competent managers that have something to say are given two minute slices to talk. As a planning commission, you should be offended that you didn't get a chance to hear this issue of short term rentals that just came forward as an urgency ordinance. Well, let me tell you about that. Shari Meads, again, is confusing the facts by saying that the economic subcommittee is the same thing as the economic recovery task force. No, the task force no public meetings that's behind closed doors. Economic subcommittee rarely convenes and they did the ramrod these urgency ordinance through with no proof. Anything that they offer doesn't get verified. Look at the meeting with the Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Advisory Board, also a, a, a faux thing here. You know, if you read that law, there's no STRs allowed on that board by law even though that we've contributed over a million dollars in BIA over the life term of that, how come we don't have that money to actually research the facts? Don't, so we don't have to hear our neighbors who try to create these economic analysis on the back of a napkin. Look at this stuff is too important to get wrong. You guys are lying to the public, you're manipulating us. I wanna to get to those brass tacks, but when I heard Shari say that her door is open to meet with me, my numerous requests over email certainly can't be ignored. In fact, allowing people to hold, to hold testimony forward only helps us when it, the rubber hits the road, either with the voters or in a court of law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alex C., I'm gonna send you permission, sorry, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Please say your, state your name for the record. Uh, hello, this is Alex. Um, hi, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Commissioner Sanders for asking really good questions. You're clearly paying attention. Um, after that, I really wanna say that, uh, you know, the financial benefit and security that comes with uh, owning one short-term rental with me and my partner uh, is real. I mean, you know, we got caught up in the layoffs recently. Uh, my mother got sick. I was faced with potentially taking a leave of absence from work. So knowing that I have a little um, income coming is <laughs> definitely a peace of mind. But I do wanna now get into my point, And I, I wanna say that I also see kind of two uh, worlds here. I see the world of myths and anecdotes and I see the world of good points and facts. You know, in fact, uh, you know, I see the, the world of, you know, people, wealthy, rich people, and people who are trying to make ends meet. Um, so let's start with the myths. You know, myth number one, 
STRs take away from the housing stock and contribute to the housing crisis and housing affordability. So we saw we also the data is 30 basis points, 0.3 percent. So don't say that. You just you're just gonna sound like a fool. It's wrong. So myth number two: noise and parties are a common occurrence. Eight eight complaints for noise out of 281. So three percent. So something doesn't add up here, right? what's going on someone's lying someone's not saying the truth so real data on noise it is not as big of a complaint myth number three my home value will decrease if i live next to an str i don't know what realtor told you this but you should fire that person because that's not true if your if your home value has decreased you should call jerome powell the fed guy and it's because of raising rates your home value is going down um and then i want to make a couple a couple of other points uh you know there's something in your data that says 119 fines out of 281 complaints i'll call it the harassment rate so 60 percent were not real 60 percent a neighbor called on a neighbor because they hate the other neighbor not because there was a real complaint thank you so much thank you jessica i'm going to send you a prompt to unmute yourself please state your name for the record Hi, my name is Jessica, and I wanted to talk about why we need to keep short-term rentals and not put restrictions that are, we already have so many restrictions on these rentals. My mother, she came from a communist country in Europe to give herself a better future and an income for our family. She worked for short-term rentals and that's how she supported her family and as i've grown up and am an adult that is how i pay for my books and for my college tuition to be a teacher and if i could not work for short-term rentals i would be forced to no longer have the ability to go to college and i wouldn't have the ability to live in beautiful sonoma county and in addition to being a Sonoma County resident my whole life, uh, short-term rentals don't just provide an income for me, but I also worry about other Sonoma County residents that are getting an income and supporting themselves from short-term rentals. Uh, short-term rentals provide local business opportunities and local businesses profit from these guests. And I also wanted to mention how um, guests are always very respectful and I haven't heard of any noise complaints of all my years working for short-term rentals. So I'd like you to think about the impact that short-term rentals would have on our economy if we restricted them. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Schneider, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Please state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Joe Schneider. I'm with the North Bay Association of Realtors. I want to thank the Planning Commission and staff for taking the time to analyze, review, and ultimately propose these changes. Uh, on its face, most of these proposals make sense in weighing economic vitality and the perceived and or real nu nuisances that short-term rentals can sometimes cause. However, there are still some concerning issues that remain with the ordinance, which I would describe as much more than some just technical changes. First, placing a cap on the number of STRs in a city only serves to block current Santa Rosa residents from earning an income on their property. As it was stated earlier, this cap is based on a time when city staff had a backlog of permits versus actual rationale for making the, the cap. Uh, we're teetering on a brink of a recession here in the country, which will have dire impacts to all residents. The ability to legally rent out someone's home may be the only viable income option that that person may have. The city has allotted 215 permit applications, uh, and so you have effectively closed the door for that potential income for hundreds of Santa Rosa residents. Second. Limiting the number of units that a person may own will not necessarily free up more inventory for renters or buyers. We live in one of the most prolific second home markets in the country. 
If someone who currently owns multiple homes is required to take one of those STRs off the market, they may choose to use that second as a use that as a second residence as opposed to put that into long term long term rental inventory. With that, the the local businesses, the city, the county will all lose out on the economic benefits and the TOT tax. Uh, we've heard from so many people this evening, and you as legislators, you have the op you have the job to use facts to create policy rather than act on emotions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else on Zoom uh, who would like to make a comment? If so, please raise your hand. Christiane Visvanthan, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Please state your name for the record. Christiane, if you're speaking, you're still muted. Christiane, you're still muted. Lonnie, would you please remind her again how to unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so my name is Christiane Gonzalez. I'm a citizen of California since 2006 and of Santa Rosa since 2021. So I know the Constitution, I'm protected by the Constitution, and I would like to know why the city of Santa Rosa is treating me differently from my neighbor who lives 900 feet from me. He has five permits, non-hosted five permits, and I cannot even apply for a permit just because he exists. Sorry, this doesn't make any sense. I would like you guys to repair that. So uh, second point is that one of the points made by the city against a part-time hybrid uh, non-hosted permit today was the difficult, difficulty in monitoring. This also doesn't make any sense. At the same time, you guys are saying that uh, it's not monitoring the TOT taxes and it's relying in the self-reporting. Uh, so what's the difference? Why you can rely on self-reporting for one thing and not for the other thing? Third point, we should all of us here be fighting against the bad operators, bad operators, not against each other. We are neighbors, we all have, a, have different reasons to like or not like, but we have to live in a society and we have to take each other's need, consider each, other, each other's <laughs> needs as well sorry i'm a little bit nervous because i'm quite uh, disappointing by what i heard today so please you guys have the job to f and have the obligation to fix the ordinance the ordinance doesn't make sense it's great to have an ordinance and have rules we all want that but we cannot discriminate we cannot segregate people and we cannot disconsider other people needs that's all. Sorry for my mood. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. That is correct. I don't see any other hands raised either. Thank you. So with that, I will go ahead and close the public hearing on this item. And um, I think how we'll work this is I heard certain themes um, from the public as well as in the all the correspondence that we received um, over the last weeks. So um, if let's let's start with uh, my fellow commissioners. Did you hear a certain theme you want to talk about? Um, and we can ask staff questions. Excuse me, Chair Weeks. Um, before you all start with deliberations, um, can I ask if someone would be willing to make a motion to uh, read the resolution? Have a motion and a second to put that on the table before starting discussion. Sure. If if it becomes the will of the commission to propose amendments or friendly amendments, et cetera, as you proceed through your deliberations, that would be appropriate at that time. Okay. If you could open with the resolution, that would be great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there somebody who's willing to, can, Commissioner Cisco? I can do that. Um, I move a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa recommending to City Council the adoption of zoning code text amendments to Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, Chapter 20-48, short-term rentals to revise and add new definitions and policies and to incorporate technical changes to improve functionality and aid in implementation and enforcement, file number REZ23-00. Zero one, and wait for the reading of the text. I Thank second. You. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. So that was moved by Commissioner Cisco and seconded by Commissioner Duggan. And now we'll talk about themes. Is that okay? So um, you want to start, uh, Commissioner Sanders? Sure. And we can talk. We can take kind of one theme at a time, and all, we'll all comment on that. Sure and see if we need further information from staff? Uh, well, the two themes that seem to stand out to me is noise, the party house, we'll call it noise and nuisance, and, and quality of life in, and being able to enjoy, you know, peaceful enjoyment of the home that you live in. Um, those seem to be the two, um, things that we're trying to balance. And um, it seems that we have to figure out a way to um, enact a, an ordinance, a policy um, that, in, that generates uh, an inclusive um, opportunity for local wealth creation, right? And at the same time, balancing the needs of all members of the community. And that's the balancing act that we're trying to, uh, you know, balance tonight. Um, so those are the two that I see. Turn that on. Uh, so with the noise, um, that is something we heard uh, also around uh, the fines and that uh, the fines should be somehow adjusted so that noise violations are uh, fined differently than leaving the garbage can out. Um, so, I'm not sure, can... I have kind of a question on that, Chair Weeks. Okay. So, go, go, go ahead, because I'm not quite sure how to, to do this. So. Sure, sure. I, um, so, we'll, we'll kind of learn as we go, I guess. Um, maybe this is for uh, Mr. Kirk, but I guess the question is, so we, we heard from neighbors, hey, there's a party, I call. Nothing seems to happen. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this this new ordinance that talks about verified complaints? You know, how is that going to happen? Are you going to have to hear the noise if the neighbors call, but there's not 24/7 staffing for code at that point? You know, what happens? What are the different scenarios? The way the ordinance is intended, I'm on. Uh, there would be. 24-7 staffing. Now, of course, there's always vagaries about staffing in the future, but uh, I, I think I said in the staff meeting that I would go out if no one else could. So we'll have someone out. Um, part of the confusion that we heard tonight was that, again, the numbers that I gave you were just from September of 2022 on. Now, when I came into this position in July, we had a considerable backlog in STR complaints that was resulting from some staffing shortages, frankly. And you heard me mention point in time complaints. And I was faced with complaints that were six months old for a noise disturbance that nobody witnessed and was long since passed. And I made the decision to close those cases. And I, I think one of our residents made reference to that tonight. Um, so, but that is in the past. And now, under the staffing we have, under the ordinance we have, uh, we have that capability to come out when there is a noise complaint. And again, we've only received eight uh, since September of 2022 and have been able to resolve those all satisfactorily so far, uh, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, we'll continue that effort. Well, but. I'm, I guess the question maybe to, to argue it a bit is assuming there's adequate staffing, the process will work. But I think 
based on my time on up here, that can be a pretty big assumption. So I guess the, the concern is if there's not adequate staffing, are our, our, our neighbors just left to twist in the wind or, you know, wh where's the teeth in this? Uh, well, I, I, again, if there's a staffing shortage and we receive a call, I'll personally be out there taking a look at it. You're in Hawaii, then, then what? Uh, then Mr. Oswald will, I'm, I'm volunteering him. <laughs> This is also for maybe my fellow commissioners. I don't mean to put you I, I mean, on the hot I, I seat. Think, I think the point I'm, I'm trying to make, and again, we are talking about uncertainties. Uh, I, I think we're getting to a point where our staffing is much more robust, and I think we're going to be able to, to meet these demands. I'm confident that we're going to be able to meet these demands. Uh, so, so then related, what, what is the final, so let's say each, each weekend for three weeks there's a noise violation. Um, at what point, you know, does the permit get pulled? Is there enforcement action? Do, th do things get red tagged? I mean, what's the next step after that? So upon a third citation being issued within a 12-month period, as we've discussed, uh, I would alert planning that um, we have a three strikes case and then they would be able to commence their revocation process. And to go back, are these verified complaints? Meaning you heard them or? A verified complaint is something that we've observed and have been able to write a citation for. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Degen. And I'm, I'm not trying to dispute anything you've said. But I'm just thinking about the weekends, like the winter Wineland weekend, when it brings tourists from all over, and they're all here to party. And what if, like, all the big short-term, non-hosted short-term rental homes with multiple bedrooms are full of people going to winter Wineland, and there you get numerous noise complaints at the same time? Can you? Can, is, is capacity big enough to deal with that? Uh, you know, I, I think we'll be able to call in backup as necessary. I'm going to stand by that. Um, one of the things that I'd like to discuss, and I don't quite know logistically how to do it, so Ms. Crocker, if you can help me, is um, I would like to see a difference in the fine schedule related to noise complaints. Um, to be, I think that would discourage uh, owners and managers from renting to bad actors or people who become bad actors even if they didn't think they were. Uh, so I, I would like to see that. Um, I think, uh, Ashley, if you could maybe do a list of things that we'd like to see changed and then we can talk about that as we go. So that's one thing I personally would like to see. Um, I don't know if my fellow commissioners... Changed which way? Uh, oh, increased. Um, so that it's, a really diff it's really differentiated with the noise, which seems to be the biggest problem we heard tonight and that we um, read in all the letters that we got um, from people. So that's something that I'd like to see changed. I'm sorry, I want to clarify. You're asking to increase the fines over and above the 1,500, 3,000, 5,000 that are proposed. I just would like to note that those are set as maximums under state law. Okay, well then have it be that the maximum for the noise and something less for To other. differentiate between the different right. infractions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Carter. Um, I'm not sure if it was uh, Sherry or, or you, Mr. Kirk, but I, I thought there was some obligation under the uh, the fee schedule and the and the current ordinance to that obligated us to those fines. Can you review? Remind me of what you said. Uh, those were the fine amounts that were, uh, I, I'm not sure how they were established, but they were established in the ordinance. They were less than the maximums, so they were allowed. Um, but, uh, and then there was a Senate bill that came, SB 60, that modified those California government code fine amounts. So that, that's what prompted us to, to align uh, the fines with those amounts. I'm not certain what um, the, the government code said at the time that the emergency ordinance was adopted, I, I. So the, 
The proposed fines are in line with state guidelines. Correct. And would would it be possible to lessen fines for other infractions and still remain within those guidelines? I guess is my yes. Question. These, as, as as Ashley said, these are these are maximums. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Duggan. Okay, I've got um, I've got one sort of related to fines and then two other ones. Um, the fine one is, is there a, a legal mechanism for an, uh, a host to pass along a fine to uh, like somebody, the, the person who rented from them that, that hosted the party on site? Is there a way for them to say, I'm, I got this $5,000 fine and I'm gonna pass it on to you? Yes, the owner of the STR can impose fines, um, but there was one commenter who had suggested that the city impose fines upon the renter, and that would not be appropriate in that the city's um, permitting uh, relationship, if you will, is with the property owner, and so fines would run to the property owner, but in turn that owner could pass the fine or whatever fine amount they wanted on to um, the renter. Okay. But I just wanted to clarify that it would not be appropriate to have the city going and imposing fines upon the renters. Okay, thank you. And then my other question was related to, um, we heard people saying that they, they had identified themselves as multiple permit holders. And can you clarify what happens? So if we decide to adopt the recommendation of one non-hosted and one hosted permit maximum per person, um, what happens to the ones that are people who have multiple ones right now? So they would be able to continue to operate as they are until their permit expires, and then it would be up to them to choose which one they wanted to renew. Um, then the others would become non-compliant with the ordinance, so they would not be able to uh, apply for a renewal for those. I would like to follow up on that question, if I could. Um, so of the people, of the folks who have uh, multiple, how many have two, how many have five, how many have 50? I know nobody has 50, but. Got to find it. I have too many notes. <clears throat> Staple wasn't big enough to hold it together, so I apologize. I've got to. I'll just add something. Well, oh, you've got it. I finally right. found it. Okay. Um, so at this point, I, I, I want to clarify that this is taking names from GIS, and sometimes those names will be it'll look different. So from my best knowledge, and this is something we would obviously verify when somebody is trying to um, uh, renew their permit, it appears that 13 entities own two, four entities own three, one entity owns five in various configurations. Their name is in, you know, with several other people. And then one entity owns six. So if, if that is totally correct and we did end up allowing only one per person, that would, um, again, I'm not saying this on the, you know, that it's for mm -hmm. sure, for sure, because it would take some definite checking. It would potentially open up 30 new opportun opportunities for new non-hosted rental operators. I, I had a follow-up that I remembered. So. Um, we heard at least testimony from at least one person saying that they have multiple short-term rentals surrounding their house, obviously within a thousand feet of each other. Um, so there's, if those people all um, renew their permits on time and don't get shut down because of um, fines, could that just go on indefinitely? Or are we gonna have some sort of sunsetting provision where we're, we're gonna maintain the thousand foot separation? So that's something that would be at your discretion. We don't have anything in the ordinance that would prevent that. One of the thoughts with also limiting them to one per person is potentially that could eliminate some in the over concentration areas, but that's a hopeful. 
So can I follow up on that? I want to make sure I understand. Um, so if somebody comes in for renewal and they're within a thousand feet of another one, do they get renewed? Yes, so the original ordinance did not, the council wanted to um, acknowledge folks that were already paying TOT and BIA prior to the ordinance being adopted. And so they wrote into the ordinance that if someone who had been paying TOT and BIA prior to um, you know, the ordinance adoption, if they applied for a short-term rental permit by December 3rd, of 2021, then they did not have to um, comply with that 1,000 foot separation setback. They were called operators in good standing, which we're trying to get away from using, but that was what they were called at that time. So since there is nothing written in the code that once that one year permit is up and they're allowed to go through the renewal process, they would be renewed in the same location. And um, you know, and like like you said, unless they sell or or lose their permit in some other way. Now that again, that's something totally within your purview, but it's not something that we have had direction from council to include. Okay. And any other comments on um, the issue of uh, the noise and the. Uh, 1,000 feet, and the, I'm, I said we're going to do one theme at a time, and here I'm going to more than one theme. So um, let's go with Commissioner Sanders. Um, with regards to this question about fines, um, you, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Kirk, um, that fines are levied when observed. Can we define what, I mean, because clearly you can't, you know, you're not there waiting for the party, you know. So. No, that's true. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, in most cases, we're responding to a complaint of some sort. Uh, if it's a point in time violation, such as noise, uh, it would typically be a complaint that would come in through our hotline. And then again, we would respond. We've got a pretty good track record of being there within half an hour. Uh, we would observe, we would listen, we would document. We would not necessarily make contact um, because again, the tenants are not going to be the people we're citing. Uh, and then we would, uh, go back to the office and, and, and process the case. How often is it that you show up and now the noise is not happening? Then what? Um, it, well, if, if it's not happening, then um, we do miss things. Uh, sometimes somebody's noisy for a moment and a complaint comes in and, and it, was just, it was just a moment. So uh, those types of things will slip by, will slip by. Habitual violators, they're going to be caught. And then what I heard today, um, which I'm almost ashamed to say I didn't even think about, but it's, it's the noise during the day, right? And, you know, we all know that dog next door that won't shut up makes it tough to go in the backyard. If you've got, I mean, what are the rules about noise during, you know, daylight hours. I mean, that would seem to be very difficult to, you know, drive around and find them for enjoying, I mean, you have long-term tenants making noise during the day. You have long-term owners making noise during the day. That stupid dog I was just talking about making noise during the day. How does that work? Well, other than uh, amplified sound, I, I don't know that there are any provisions in the code that would cover that. Now, now keep in mind, there are, there are other provisions of law, uh, such as there's provisions of the penal code that uh, the police department could enforce uh, for a disturbance that is outs outside of the SDR ordinance. Um, and so we could, we could consider something like that if, if the commission so desired to try to work something out for daytime uh, disturbances. But um, right now, I, I believe it's just amplified sound that we talk about in the ordinance. So what do you think that would look like? I'm just deferring to your expertise. Oh, um, it could be based upon decibel levels, like our, our noise ordinance is. We could, we could refer the, uh, reference the noise ordinance. That might be the easiest way to do it. Um, because again, it would apply to, it would apply to all properties, but we could also apply it to SDRs. Uh, that, that's the one that most comes to mind. Thank you. 
Chair Weeks, could I? Can I add something just about the noise? Sorry. Um, I believe that our noise ordinance is based upon, a, it's a CNEL standard, I believe, which is like a 24-hour standard, so it doesn't capture single event noise, which I believe is like an LMAX factor, so that if you've got a you know, slamming door or repetitive ball noise, those are single event noises. If I'm getting the terminology correct, I'm not a noise expert, but so I think it would be difficult in this instance to say you, you couldn't really compare a loud party that lasted an hour wouldn't necessarily violate the noise ordinance over the whole 24 hour period. So I don't know that that would be a metric in our current um, noise ordinance in any event that would uh, prove useful here. And then I just wanted to note also that um, oftentimes too those, those types of property rights for quiet enjoyment, if you will, are enforced through public and private nuisance claims and governed by some other sections of the code. So. I want to offer that to you. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Just one comment, Mr. Kirk. Um, uh, kudos to you because there were people in the gallery today who thanked you personally for the work that you've done in helping this along, and we have seen a a big difference between the wild, wild west days prior to the ordinance and to now you being here and uh, I think you refer to it as a you know landing into a maintenance uh, area so I mean that tells me that you're doing a good job so thank you I'm surrounded by good people but thank you for saying so Vice Chair Peterson um, we're a little bit down the road a bit, but uh, to put some structure on this, I, I'm just looking at the, the presentation starting on slide 11. I mean, is, is there a value to my fellow commissioners in going section by section with the proposed amendments and seeing who's in, what looks good, who's in favor, who's against, any tweaks? Yes, that I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you for putting some structure in this. <laughs> and then that would enable uh, the commission, if you desire, to, to talk in those um, general categories and you can you know, engage in some straw votes and things that you've done in the past to try to, to garner ideas for if anyone would like to propose any amendments. So if we start with... Um, Section 20-48.010, the purpose, any changes in that section, anybody? Okay, uh, the next section, uh, the application of this, cha of this chapter, any changes, corrections? Um, then we go into definitions. Um, were there any, it was deletion of unnecessary terms, adding some other definitions. Uh, the one thing I had in this section is the operator in good standing term, which I know you talked about before, Sherry, about making it that that is just a, it's a hard concept, I think. Um, so I don't know if there's, I know you said you wanted to try and get away from that term. So I would love to be able to just delete that term, but because of what we've talked about so far this evening and that these original applicants were able to avoid that 1,000 foot separation requirement, we have to keep that as a category of permit holders. Um, the good thing is it, it's just those people, that sounds terrible to say it that way, it's the, just, it just represents those applicants, um, so it's not something that we have to say a lot, but it does explain why in some cases non-hosted short terminal permits are you know, on properties that are closer than 1,000 feet apart. We could change it, we could call it something else, um, which I would be totally open to, but it, it would be kind of confusing because of us having yes, used that all along. I, I, I totally understand that. Introducing something new so, would be, yeah. Yeah, so um, any changes in that section for anybody? Uh, sure, I think uh, this is the first instance of it and I think it'll have implications throughout. Um, 
I guess my position after hearing the testimony uh, from the public today, reading what we've got online, is that um, I would remove non-hosted uh, short-term rentals from this ordinance. I would only permit hosted rentals, and I wouldn't worry about the cap, things like that. Can you repeat that? So, for instance, uh, former sub M, current sub J, um, I would just delete. The non-hosted rentals are outside this ordinance. They're not permitted in the city, only hosted rentals. Is that, would that be a problem in any way for enforcement? Well, they still have to get a permit if they're a non-hosted. I mean, if they're hosted, they still have to get a permit. Can I, think I ask? He's banning them. <laughs> yeah, I think. Can I ask I for clarification? It, I think that's what I thought yeah. I heard, um, yeah. Commissioner Peterson. Are you suggesting that the city not allow non-hosted at all anymore? Correct. So elim eliminate non-hosted in the city. Correct. Okay. So I think we could have a discussion about that and figure out where we all stand on that. Okay, thoughts, people? I'll, I'll kick it off. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, so what, what we heard tonight, what we've read um, is that, you know, if you own a non-hosted, you're in favor, and if you're a neighbor, you're against. And from what we heard from staff, you know, the amendments to this, what I see, Short-term rentals seem to be a hotel that exists outside of the restrictions that are, a hotel is normally subject to. Um, there are some self-certification aspects to it, but it's not ADA compliant. It's not, you know, code enforcement isn't going out there to inspect to see where the fire pit is. They theoretically have signs uh, for emergency exits. They're theoretically training their guests if there's a wildfire. But I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that. Um, happening in reality, especially if it's a, you know, a frequent booking. Um, so there, there's sort of the, the policy end of, of that where it looks like a hotel, it acts like a hotel, but it's not subject to the same kind of restrictions a hotel is. Um, there's the resource issue for the city. Again, I, I think code enforcement is doing a great job. This is nothing uh, to do with, with staff, but I think Things are going to ebb and flow. The city is going to have more and less uh, resources to commit to this. And again, if it's a self-certification enforced essentially by neighbors, I, you know, I, I think it's a it's a hard sell um, when it's non-hosted. When there's somebody that's not there, that's invested in the community um, on site to kind of deal with it. Um, and then, you know, finally, the the kind of the technical things when it gets to the the resolution is. I think it's going to be hard for me to make a finding that uh, a non-hosted rental uh, as part of this ordinance is consistent with the general plan and the zoning code. When you look at the, the zoning code, um, you know, it's to provide home rental and ownership opportunities, choices in housing types to improve access to affordable housing. There's nothing about, you know, owning two, three, four, five, ten rental properties and short-term renting them. Um, it seems incompatible with the purposes of residential zoning um, and the same with the general plan. You know, if you look at the policies that the general plan lays out, meeting the housing needs of Santa Rosans, uh, maintain and rehabilitate the housing supply to support affordable housing, expand the housing supply to make it available to low-income households. Uh, I just, I, I don't see that. Certainly, I mean, I, I think you could go as, as far as just banning short-term rentals, um, but at least when it comes to non-hosted, this, this just seems outside the scope of Santa Rosa's ordinances and, and policy documents, so. Um, and, it, and I understand the, you know, what we've heard too from uh, short-term rental owners, but you can still rent the property. There's, the, you just, it's just longer for than 30 days. So I, I don't know. It, it's, um, it's hard for me to make the findings and then as, as a policy recommendation to council, uh, I, I don't see a lot of value in, in non-hosted rentals at this point. Have you given it any thought as to how um, that would affect the, the current 
short-term rental, the 198, um, they would just at some point, well, I guess that would be up to the attorney to calculate, to figure out uh, as to how you would eliminate them. It would be the one-year renewal, they just aren't renewed. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the technical implication, um, certainly I need the assistance of Ms. Crocker, but. Uh, I would say that after the one-year term, as we had been talking about with some of the other proposals, the um, you would not be able to renew that permit. So over, you know, a year's time, they would all basically just be eliminated because nobody could come in for renewal, and you could not issue any new ones. They would become legal non-conforming uses during that interim period. Thoughts, uh, Commissioner Cisco. Well, I, I, what I'm um, hoping we remember is that there is a current ordinance. It was vetted very thoroughly through council um, with all of the same kind of public comments. Um, the council at that time, I assume, assumed that there's a place for short-term rentals in our uh, uh, policies. And um, what we're being asked to do is to take a look at the technical changes. And I, I think making a move towards banning them would, would be a fairly drastic recommendation. I don't think that's what we were being asked to do. And I think that it has been vetted and determined by the council that the short-term rentals are consistent with the general plan and have a place in Santa Rosa, have some economic um, uh, benefit, as well as um, a lot of the modifications that we're making uh, through uh, code enforcement to make them operate better. So I would not be in favor of uh, making that recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Duggan? Why not? Um, well, I can see the, the logic of um, Vice Chair Peterson's comments. I think if, if that determination comes down, it should come from council in their direction. I feel like um, Commissioner Cisco said it's like we're just making some technical changes and the policy should be up to the council. Um, and I think there's, if we did um, advocate for and or if council decided to ban non-hosted rentals, there should be a place for um, people like one of, the, one of the public who spoke saying he lives within 20 feet of his short-term rental. And it's a separate property, but he's right there, and he considers it a hosted one. But because of living in a separate parcel, it's a non-hosted permit. And I should think there should be a consideration for someone like that in that situation that they are effectively managing the rental and policing it, but they're not technically on site. Commissioner Sanders? Um, I guess it would seem to me that jumping to banning um, is, you know, a couple of steps down in this process. Um, you know, at this point, um, enforcement, even by the admission of some people here who probably would like it to be banned, um, recognize that the new enforcement, the new ordinance that we have put into place has made a drastic difference uh, in enforcement, you know, after the ordinance than it was prior. So it seems that, you know, we're working with something that's, you know, it's a works in progress and it's it's moving in the right direction. To then jump to banning just seems a little, it's like, the, you know, those are a few steps. Um, certainly easier, you know, just to say, oh, just forget it, we'll, we'll ban it. Uh, but I think, you know, we could do a little bit more work together uh, to make this work for everyone, or as many people as we can. Commissioner Carter. Yeah, I'm, I mean, one of the first notes I wrote down is the, the use that's allowed by right in residential neighborhoods is housing in residential use. And it's hard to make an argument that there are uh, rights to making uh, making money off of the property in residential uses. I mean, the way you do that is through sale or rental of them, long-term rental. Um, but I think, as Commissioner Dugan pointed out and uh, Commissioner Cisco, the direction from council was to create an ordinance to manage short-term rentals, not to 
uh, eliminate them necessarily. I do think that um, the ordinance as proposed now has a lot more teeth and gives more um, capacity for enforcement. And uh, we've been told by staff that the capacity exists to enforce the ordinance as written now. So I'm going to take them at their word on it on that. Um, so I think the ordinance is written as a, a cleaned up regulatory device is going in the direction that the council wants. I certainly think the council within their purview could decide for a much more restrictive ordinance uh, given the, the problems we've heard with the operations of STRs in, in our residential areas. Um, so while I'm not ready to jump to uh, a recommendation to the council that uh, non-hosted um, short-term short rentals, and maybe if we called them casual lodging instead of short-term rentals, we'd ha not be having a lot of this discussion because it is a lodging enterprise that we're talking about here. Um, so I think more regulation with staff's assurance that what we've got before us is a enforceable, and again, it's a cooperatively enforceable involving the permittees, the, the renters, the staff, and code enforcement people. Um, there's a lot of responsibility spread around here, but um, it's not a perfect ordinance, but it may be workable as, as we've seen it, and I would be more on the side of supporting it uh, to go forward to the council and perhaps um, passing on uh, consideration, our considerations for changes that, that the council should be considering, if that made any sense. Thank you. Uh, well, so uh, let me respond to sort of two things. One, um, I do think it is within the, the purview of the Planning Commission to make a, a recommended change like that. We, we've done it with uh, downtown station area specific plans. We, we've done it with the general plan. Um, I, I, I think removing uh, non-hosted short-term rentals from this ordinance um, is, is not beyond the, the pale when it comes to our, our powers and duties. And I mean, we started off with a statement of purpose. so. Um, I, I, you know, look back at that. Um, I, I guess I can propose um, a straw poll on <laughs> removing uh, non-hosted short-term rentals from this ordinance. Um, I have a, a sense of how it will go, but we can at least. I'm looking at uh, Ms. Crocker, can, is that? I believe I just heard uh, each of you provide your comments and thoughts on this, except for Chair Weeks. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, I, it would be hard for me to eliminate all of the non-hosted, to eliminate non-hosted short-term rentals. I think the ordinance, um, the proposed ordinance, um, in my view, needs some, a few changes, which we'll get to, um, to make it a uh, little more, I don't even know what the right word is. A little easier on uh, neighbors, uh, but I think uh, until we hear from the council that they want to do away with uh, non-hosted short-term rentals, I'm, would be hard, it would be hard for me to make that. So, I think there you got it. <laughs> Five one. <laughs> So then let's go on to the other amendments. Oh, and do we have any other amendments on any other changes on the definitions section? So then uh, we'll go to the requirements uh, section 20-48.040. Uh, short-term rental permits requirements and limits. In one, I want to follow up on uh, a comment that we heard from a member of the public that Commissioner D Duggan uh, mentioned, uh, where they live 
adjacent to their sh non hosted short term rental, but it's a different address, so they have to, so they're, you know, very close, so they can monitor what's going on, but it's a different address, so it wouldn't, it's not considered a non host, it's not considered a hosted, it's considered non hosted. Was there any discussion in, at any time about certain number of feet between your primary residence and your non-hosted STR? Thank you, Chair Weeks, good question. So when we designed this ordinance, we wanted it to be ministerial. So there's not discretion involved with, you know, uh, whether these 20 feet are, you know, more or less impactful than these 20 feet from another house. Um, so we did limit it to um, being on the same parcel. Um, originally, we actually said it had to be in the same home, but then um, we did relax that to be if they're in a legal dwelling unit on the same parcel. But I, I obviously your discretion, but I, I feel like we were trying to keep things very ministerial and either yes, you're on the same parcel or you know, or you're not type of thing. And so that's one of the reasons that we didn't incorporate a whole bunch of different nuances like that. And we also don't want to make it any more confusing to administer, enforce, or permit. But obviously it is totally your discretion. Any comments on that, uh, Commissioner Sanders? It, it would be difficult because, I mean, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, I live right next door to it. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, I will know firsthand if there's something going on and I can, you know, intervene personally by walking out my front door and going next door. Well, then the next one comes, well, I only live two houses away. So I can walk you know, a few more feet and go knock on that door. Well, I only live around the corner. Well, I lived in the next neighborhood. Well, I, you know, and you can see where this goes. So, you know, I don't know how, you know, at a certain point you gotta kind of draw a line. You know, in my thought, I, I know it, it doesn't, it's not, it's not, I guess in the interest of, you know, the, the broader picture, it, it stinks. I, I live right next door. Why can't this be? But you do have to, you know, make a decision or else you're down the road and, the, you know, the, the horse has left the barn and you can't stop it. Any comments on that? Well, I, I agree with everything that uh, Commissioner Sanders is saying. I think it, you, where do you stop? And yeah. Yeah, I can appreciate if it's, um, we're intending this to be ministerial, it's like you have to draw the line somewhere and this is a good hard line, so. Okay, so then uh, we'll continue with short-term rental permit requirements and limits. Any comments on the rest of that section? I've got something for you. Yes. <laughs> um, it, for uh, discussion, I mean, we, we've seen it, you know, we saw it with the cannabis ordinance. Um, is there a reason to treat hosted short-term rentals differently than non-hosted? I mean, I, I'm going to lose on that. So for the record, would remove. But, um, you know, putting a cap on the total number of permits issued, having separation requirements uh, for hosted as well. This is B sub 1 ABC. Was there uh, any discussion uh, in any of the work groups about that? R originally, somewhat, we threw, you know, we talked about, we tried to talk about everything, but council was very, um, I don't want to say adamant. They were very, um, they wanted hosted to be available to anybody, anywhere. So we took their direction completely when we wrote that there's no limit on hosted and they can be in any zoning district and they can be right next door to each other. Now, I will say that we've worked with this ordinance for 18 months now. So if, if people want to see changes like that, maybe we ask Lou, have there been issues with too many hosted near each other with parking issues or something like that? But that's how we ended up with that. It was a, it was just, we, we felt that hosted were not causing the same level of complaints or potential nuisance issues. 
Any discussion on that? Well, I think if we go back to the definition, I think the reason everyone is, or council was maybe um, more considerate of the hosted is that it's required that they're sleeping in the same building at the same time as the rental. So, you know, living down the street or whatever and checking on it isn't the same as I'm in the room in the house with the, you know, so I think it eliminates a lot of problems. So, and they're valuable that way. Commissioner Sanders. Just a question, does that, you know, um, Proximity, I mean, does that uh, refer to, I know, two different parcels, right? Or the same parcel with a, uh, a separate living unit. Does that, you know, does that count? It has to be on the same parcel right. and it has to be a legal dwelling unit. Does that make sense? To be hosted. So you can stay in your ADU and rent out your main house as a short-term rental, and that's considered hosted because you're on the same parcel. And the assumption there was, again, as um, others have mentioned, that you're going to be aware of what's going on and be able to, you know, manage the situation if anything arises. So, so here's my concern. Again, building from the cannabis ordinance, you know, which was concerned with overconcentration, creating sort of a red light district for, for cannabis, we heard from the public that, yes, theoretically, my neighbor lives in the 500 square foot ADU and it's a hosted, but I'm also surrounded by parties every weekend. So I guess that's, you know, there's going to be neighborhoods that are more and less attractive for hosted in quotes, uh, rentals. So I guess that, that would be my concern for, for having them treated separately without setbacks um, and with, without a cap on the number. Any other comments? Okay. So then we'll go on to... Um, uh, See, where are we? The short term rental permit. So we have the neighbor notification, uh, transferability, loss of operating good standing status, denial, appeals, et cetera. Um, anybody have anything else on that section? Okay, uh, okay. So then we'll go to registration requirements. Uh, anything on that section or on the occupancy and parking requirements? Any? Which specifically, which uh, letters are you? Sorry? Which letters are you looking at? Oh, I'm sorry. It's um, 20-48. Dot O six O uh, occupancy and parking requirements. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then uh, operating requirements, which is twenty dash forty eight dot O seven O. Commissioner Duggan. Yeah. On um, this one, I've got. Um, a uh, question for my fellow commissioners, let's say. Um, I personally am not comfortable with having fire pits in the city and also having the onus be on the neighbors to alert their uh, short-term rental neighbors that, you know, to spare the air day and put out the fire and that kind of thing. So I would be happy to take that out of the ordinance. Uh, uh, comments? As would I. <laughs> As would I. I. I don't like those fire pits, uh, even before we had fires. <laughs> well, as the firefighter, I would have to say, <laughs> bad idea. So can we add that to the fr a friendly amendment that we would eliminate the section um, or somehow clarify the section regarding uh, outdoor fires, which is outdoor burning, it's five point, it's five, right? There you go. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, um, are you talking about striking recreational fires, fire pits, 
outdoor fireplaces. Yes. And leaving barbecues and grills. I. I or do we want to maybe want to maybe to clarify that it has to be only. Um, Maybe we should get Paul on here because are we talking about even if it's gas, propane, which well, I'm I, fine I with. I just a, want to make sure that we're covering yeah. all of it. Because I would make a big distinction between a you know a gas fired barbecue grill and an outdoor fire pit. I mean, you're okay with a barbecue. Well, I could be, not necessarily, but um, yeah. But I would be happy if the whole section, you know, if it's just outdoor burning was prohibited. A question for consideration on this. So um, they're allowed in all zoning districts. Not all zoning districts have the same level of wildland urban interface or, or fire danger. Um, do you want to tie it to something like that? I mean, I don't know if that's feasible for staff, but. So are, are you saying if you're in the buoy that you don't, you can't do fires, and if you're not, you can? Yes, I mean something that would again be feasible to include in an ordinance. You know, I mean, if somebody's having a barbecue on Cherry Street downtown, they're, it's probably okay. Um, yes and no, I guess. Um, you know, um, an, an outdoor fire thing is, you know, I've got my little paper cup right there, and all of a sudden that falls in, and then embers are flying around because that's what embers do, um, as opposed to a grill, which has a cover, preferably someplace not near uh, um, wood structures, old wood, that kind of thing. So it just seems that, you know, with an open fire pit, you may be inviting, you know, um, uh, laziness, uh, not laziness is a terrible word to say, um, people may not be as diligent uh, around an open f open flame, is my thought. Uh, yes, sorry, to be clear, I, I'm in favor of outdoor burning pits. I think barbecues, maybe you could tweak depending on the... I don't know what the definition would be, but like a covered barbecue grill? Something for cooking. Specifically for cooking, not charcoal. <laughs> if I may assist a little bit here, back in the day I used to be a fire marshal. There's some clear differentiations between outdoor burning with solid fuels versus gas barbecues, propane barbecues. So, if we could be clear, try to try to isolate what we really are after. And hey, Paul, Paul is with us. Um, I don't want to steal his thunder, but there's there's already a prohibition for using solid fuels for flames in the wildland urban interface during fire season. So would we want to carry that throughout regardless, just within the WUI, throughout the city regardless of where they are, and they are an STR, so we want to try and find that path to be clear so we're able to write the ordinance to your desires, or at least the recommendation to, to help with that. But, but this particular uh, prohibition would only be for the non-hosted uh, non rentals. It doesn't have to be citywide. It's just simply saying that citywide, wherever these non-hosted rentals are, we don't want any fire happening <laughs> anytime, whether it's wildfire season or not. <laughs> so I mean, we, we could adopt it that way, right? We could amend it that way without impacting our other fire ordinances. Yeah, I think if we could have uh, um, our fire marshal, Paul Lowenthal, speak to this. Sorry, thank you. Um, so yeah, so the attempt was to resolve the concerns regarding fire. We tried to differentiate the differences between solid burning and gas fired. So the risk associated with the open fire is typically from ember cast, which was why we tried to tie in the language specific to eliminating that solid fuel type fire during fire season when there's the risk that um, a fire pit could spread um, and then would transition it to a gas fueled where you're not gonna be dealing with the, the ember cast. Uh, if there's a desire to be more stringent on it, then yes, we can look at potentially eliminating solid burning 
period, uh, regardless of time of year um, and or uh, potentially the, the, the gas fire as well. Uh, we were, again, just trying to minimize the risks, um, still allow some activities to take place, um, but cut the cut the ember cast out uh, and replace it with with fuel uh, fuel fired uh, activities. Um, we can definitely take it further um, and again look at uh, additional restrictions that are tied to the WUI, uh, or if there's obviously the desire from uh, the commission to take it even further, then we can look at what that means uh, across the city. Uh, specific to uh, what the captain had brought up earlier, uh, we have uh, put these short-term rentals in our CAD system. So when we do respond to incidents or complaints that come in through the 911 system about a fire, uh, we do have the ability to uh, uh, handle these from an enforcement standpoint much differently with a, with a response uh, uh, from our department as well. So we did really did try and uh, look at it from all different angles to how we can keep some of the activities taking place still, but make them as safe as possible. I, I guess my view is why take the risk? I mean, yeah. the, the upside seems limited and the downside seems enormous. So I think saying, oh, within fire season to somebody who's from out of town and hasn't lived here yeah. through fire season, it's like, I'd rather have specific dates if we kept that anything in there about burning outside. I'd also like to add that, um, you know, no one's gonna be as diligent and as careful with their home than the homeowner and, and know, you know, be familiar with what's going on in their home. When you're bringing in guests, I mean, you know, the fire marshal is correct, and you are also correct that, you know, solid burning fuels are going to cast embers where gas fires don't or won't uh, under the best, you know, conditions. But, you know, again, I've seen that cup. I've seen that whatever place on the edge of the fire pit and because someone's not really paying attention and then you know it doesn't necessarily turn into a conflagration but you know having your deck burned down or your fence burned down stinks so why yeah i agree with um, the vice chair you know why chance it yeah, i also would like to be stricter um so i know uh mr lowenthal said that you guys could work on something um, before it goes to the council. Uh, I, I just think, I mean, we've had such horrific experiences that I think it's better to be safe than sorry. So if I'm gonna propose a friendly amendment, again, I'm not sure what work needs to be done on it if we're just saying this should be removed as an option. <laughs> I don't get what else needs to happen as far as recommending to council what we want. <laughs> Actually, you're, you're right. If we just say there will be no outdoor burning. So okay. I think that would be that on work. number five. It would be outdoor burning, recreational fires, fire pits, outdoor fireplaces, barbecue grills, and other similar items are not permitted. Yeah, that sounds like a really good, simple statement to me. So I would propose that friendly amendment uh, to that particular section uh, five. Are there and Okay, so anything else? On well, we'd need a second if somebody wants to go oh, with there. I would, second. Well, I would second it, and I also I would accept the friendly amendment as stated. So, I didn't hear a friendly amendment actually be proposed. I thought we were still just hypothesizing. But okay, well, I, yeah, I would propose a friendly amendment amending um, section five to say. Uh, recreational fires, fire pits, outdoor fireplaces, barbecue grills, and other similar items are not permitted. And just leave it with that. That's my friendly amendment. That's the first friendly amendment. That's the first and only one so far, yeah. <laughs> so does, and does Commissioner Duggan need to Commissioner Duggan, do you it? agree to that friendly yes. amendment? Yes, I do. Thank you. Yes. So the motion on the table is now the friendly amendment. It, it will include the friendly amendment. Correct. And before we vote, we, I can go ahead and summarize that resolution again with whatever friendly amendments or other options we've changed. So we'll keep it clear. 
So do we vote on each friendly amendment as it comes up, or do we wait till the end when we might have others? I think we should continue in the discussion. And I'm sorry. As of, we should continue in the discussion because I believe you have more to go through here. So the motion on the table as it stands now is the original resolution amended to delete section 2048070 or modify 28070 sub 5 as um, proposed and accepted in the friendly amendment. So we move on to the next thing. So we do vote on it now? No. no, no I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> We're good. Thank you. It takes a village. Thank you. And, uh, Chair Weeks, yes. uh, if I could, before we move on to the next section, which I believe is the enforcement section, um, I'm hoping that we can uh, take a step back and go back to uh, section 20-48.040. It would be B2, or sorry, B, B3. Um, this is the one that is limiting the uh, non-hosted short-term rentals to a maximum of one per property owner. Um, I, I'm not sure, unless I missed it, I don't think that there was discussion from the commission on that one and it was a topic. Um, and so hoping to get some feedback from the commission on that one. Mr. Sanders. Yeah, I would like it to be three. And uh, I don't know how we move forward from that, but I guess my rationale is we've got, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Uh, well, looking at the numbers, we only have, what did we say, one that has six, and the vast majority have two. Some have three, but top out at six. And, you know, to say that you now can't do this activity tomorrow that you were able to do yesterday, I'm not comfortable with that. So um, I also think that, you know, it allows for, you know, I mean, my whole thought process is about creating opportunities for our citizens, our people, which most of the short-term rental owners in Santa Rosa are Santa Rosa residents. Let's not hamstring people who've, you know, have been counting on this uh, for their retirements, their income. Um, I mean, what, we're, what I'm seeing in this room is that there are not a lot of, you know, rich corporate fat cats. I mean, maybe you are. I don't know. Maybe you guys are all rich fat cats. I don't know. But you seem like nice enough folks to me. And um, I think that that's a reasonable number. Also, since we're talking about less than 1% at the numbers that we are now, um, I don't think we're getting anywhere close to, I mean, I, I'm sure that hopefully we'll get that those numbers, like that question I asked about, you know, what is the saturation before it really starts to affect housing? Maybe we'll get answers to that, but I don't think that three uh, begins to touch that. So I'll bring that up for more discussion from the uh, my fellow commissioners. Any comments? I mean, so my position would be zero, but uh, in, instead, I mean, I think, I think the idea, again, you know, looking at the resolution and trying to make the findings, uh, it starts to look like a very commercial enterprise if you've got three non-hosted and one hosted. That doesn't look to me like, you know, hey, I want to make some extra cash. I, you know, I want to go travel for a month at a time or visit family for a couple weeks. That starts to look, you know, beyond the scope of this ordinance to me. Um, so, I, you know, my, my sense would be one non-hosted short-term rental per person seem, seems appropriate within the scope of what the ordinance is trying to do with what we've heard from the public, the owners. These are, you know, not generally, you know, big commercial enterprises, so um, I would not be in favor of more than one. I agree with uh, Commissioner Peterson. Commissioner Duggan. I also agree with Commissioner Peterson. I think especially if we have this um, cap right now of 198, that if we restrict it to one per host, then we have that many more people who are eligible to participate. Commissioner Carter. I'm in agreement that the cap should uh, remain as proposed. 
And I'm also in agreement that it should remain as one. So, so uh, I lose. Was there, did, did you want to go on to enforcement or was there something else that we needed to clean up? No, that was it. Thank you. Okay. So then 20-48.080, uh, enforcement. Um, I'm sorry. Yes, what, yes, which, what would you like to go back to? Um, in 20-48.070, uh, um, it talks about uh, two, Section two, uh, amplified music, amplified outdoor music. Um, what does that do? How do we address, you know, the music wasn't outdoors, it was inside, we just opened the windows. Yeah, please. Which, which number is that? That's, um, oh, the next page. B, section two, um, subsection B. So um, that is specific to outdoor, as you mentioned. However, the ordinance does tie back to our, this ordinance, the STR ordinance, ties back to our normal noise ordinance. So if something was happening in the house that was beyond what the city's noise ordinance allows, that would be, would, that would still be a, um, a short-term rental violation because it's, noted here in the section that short-term rentals and daytime gas shall comply with all requirements of city code section chapter 17-6, which is our noise ordinance. Okay, thank Does that you. answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, uh, enforcement. Uh, this is going back to my comment earlier about, um, I'd like the maximum fines to be associated with noise uh, rather than other things. Um, I don't know, is there any agreement on that or disagreement? Um, I, I think it, there's kind of a moral hazard question. Um, you know, if you carve out specific <laughs> exceptions, um, I think there's, there's the opportunity for uh, particularly non-hosted to engage in kind of consistent bad behavior potentially with, with relatively minor fines. Um, so I, I'm in favor of, of keeping it a, as it is. I, I would, um, again, we, we heard I think enough and, and read enough uh, that in fact things are not working even with the heroic efforts of, of code enforcement. So I think putting some sting into it um, will incentivize the property owner, especially in a non-hosted, to keep on top of the guests. Any other comments on that? Um, uh, I agree with Commissioner Peterson. I also agree with Commissioner Peterson. Okay. Commissioner Carter. Yeah, I think we've heard, heard from a lot of um, operators uh, of how the ordinance could be tweaked to deal with their situation more equitably, but I think coming back to the fact that we wanted a ministerial document here that's easy to administer, I'm more inclined to keep things as they are and, and not try to carve out some different fine schedules. Okay. Commissioner Sanders? Yeah, I just... It's tough to think that we're going to send someone a $1,500 bill because they had a sign that wasn't on the property. That's not the same thing. It's not the same nuisance as, um, you know, a big party. Um, I'd love for us to be able to. Uh, the, the, the counterpoint would be that we're relying on self-certification and self-regulation. And I think absent some teeth, it's really easy to, you know, ah, I, I, I tried, but, you know. Yeah. And you won't, you won't make the same mistake twice. Right? And I'm, I'm hoping that when you present this to council that you'll, as part of your presentation, you'll, t you'll mention that some of the concerns we had as, you know, like maybe one or two per people had a concern, but it didn't, we, you know, it didn't rise to the majority. Absolutely. And I do want to clarify too, that when you mentioned like not having a sign or something like that, 
code enforcement is complaint driven. We're not going out and knocking on doors and saying, do you have your permit hanging in the right place or whatever. So I think it's important to know that if something is made, if code enforcement is made aware of something, it's something that I, I, most of the time I would say is going to be a noise or, or parking or occupancy or advertising for too many people staying at your home um, and not so much a sign that's not posted. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, anything else on this section on enforcement? Commissioner Duggan. Uh, this is not um, enforcement, but it's something else that came up during the meeting. Somebody mentioned that we could require two night minimum stay. And I'm just wondering if anybody else was inclined to do that. Thoughts? I have no idea how, how you would enforce that. That seemed more like an on an Airbnb ad. Maybe that's what you would put, but I guess Jesse, Lou, what, what would we do with that as a requirement? That's true. It'd be, it would be very hard to enforce. I, I acknowledge that. As mentioned a few times, the, this is a, many of the elements are self-certified. One of the elements that this could look like is that it be clear because we because we do have very specific requirements on what their ads shall and shall not indicate. If the uh, proposal is to move forward, it would be a requirement of at least the advertisement, and then the the rest would rely on complaints that to to be able to enforce. So it, it is a a good question: is how do you enforce that? So I I would say it would be basically on the advertisement and then complaints. Um, if I may, um, I, I heard that suggestion too, and I thought it was you know, very compelling. But ultimately, I think that that was a shout out to fellow STR operators that, hey, if you want to stay in good standing, this is something you might want to consider doing on your own, not something that we should probably try and put into an ordinance. I'd, I'd try for it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, if if that's if that solves the problem that the neighbors are having, for instance, right? It... So, is that? Do you want to see if we have a straw? Do you want to do a straw poll on two night minimum? Sure. Yes. I'll say yes. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, one uh, thing in my notes that nobody brought up tonight but that we got in a couple of letters and it was about garbage cans, uh, about that the city should, as part, part of the permit should require the largest size garbage can um, just to make sure there's not trash around. And I wondered if there had been discussion about that in any of your meetings. We didn't discuss specific um, receptacle sizes, but that's definitely something you could add if you wanted to. Um, certainly we're hoping that people are recycling instead of just putting everything in the trash cans, but I, I think that that's definitely something we could include although I'm not sure how we would verify that I guess yeah. upon application they would have to submit a recology bill showing that it was the largest I mean we could figure out a process for it if that's something you guys wanted to do yeah I didn't think that the city monitored that I thought that was between the, the owner and the in recology so does the city somehow have a say in what we, size we we don't have and that's why I was saying we would if we wrote that into the ordinance as a requirement for an, a short term rental we would then um, and I'm assuming you guys are thinking of this more for non hosted short term rentals mm -hmm. then upon the application we would just request a copy of something showing that they have the largest receptacles that are possible but thinking you know what you just said about um, 
recycling, we want people to recycle and compost, so it kind of defeats the purpose, saying you have to have a, the hugest, the biggest garbage can there is, so forget I even mentioned. <laughs> well, and, and we do have in here a new policy that says that they can't have trash and recycling that's not within the receptacles, mm -hmm. so if the owner ends up getting in trouble because people are leaving stuff laying around, they would likely get the largest receptacle and, and maybe um, have something in their rental agreement talking about recycling. Um, one thing um, that I haven't asked before uh, is, do you, when somebody comes in and gets a permit, do you give them a list of, like, good do's and don'ts for being a sh STR host? Like, make sure you uh, put the garbage in the garbage can, make sure you do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so when somebody gets a permit, we actually have something that goes with their permit that basically lists out every single thing that's required in the ordinance. Um, there are also sections on the web page that talk about compliance and that type of thing, but we're always open to new ideas um, if you have anything to to um, to make it better. Thank and you. I think Lou had something he wanted to add. Yeah, if I, if I may just add on to that. After the uh, urgency ordinance was amended and prior to the ramp up and enforcement that occurred in September, we sent out a, a notice to every known uh, STR operator, every known applicant, every known local contact. I think we set out over 500 pieces of paper just letting them know that uh, there had been a change in the ordinance, that code enforcement was going to be ramping up based upon where we'd been in the past. And one of the things we included was something we called a success guide for SDR operators. And it was just what you're describing. It was a list of, of, of do's and don'ts to, uh, to essentially not run afoul of the ordinance. And we still have that document. So that's something we could easily re revitalize and continue to use. Good. Uh, any other comments, questions before we take a vote? Take a vote. <laughs> so we have the, excuse me, the ordinance with the friendly amendment, uh, and that was uh, Commissioner Cisco and Commissioner Duggan, if I recall. Um, is that right? So, um, do you, before we take the vote, let me just ask, do you have what you need from us before you go to council? And then also, I think you're going to council mid-June, mid is that right? So I believe that we have everything that we need and Sherry can uh, verify. Um, but at this point, uh, it's looking like the item will be scheduled for uh, potentially the first meeting in July okay. for council. So you have what you need from us. I just want to make sure there is only the one friendly amendment and that is to the outdoor burning section and instead of saying are permitted with the following restrictions, we're going to strike that part and just say are not permitted, full mm -hmm. stop. I yeah. think, is that, yep, that's that it? And that I know we've, it. Been, we've been taking notes feverishly so we will summarize, you know, where there was maybe some discussion that didn't end up in a unanimous thought. Okay. And just to add on to that, just to clarify for the record that the section that we are referring to in the outdoor burning is 20-48070 sub B5. Hold on. <laughs> yes. It's the, the section yes. under operating requirements is 2048.070. Yes, that's correct. B5. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so we can call for the vote now. Before we vote, can we thank staff for all their hard work? <laughs> yes. Especially thank you here. all. What is this? How many hours later? But thank you for all the hard work and giving us all the good information we need to make this, this happen tonight. 
And thank you for those who I know are in the wings and uh, for, to Captain Corcoran and officers uh, and Fire Marshal Lowenthal, as well as all of you. Thank you. <laughs> so, good. And I will add all these citizens that showed up to let their yes. feelings be known. Yeah, I, I do think a lot of times we're up here and there's nobody that shows up and we've not heard from anybody and it's really nice to see what I consider democracy in action and that's my little soapbox. So. <laughs> so. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Do, you, you, do you have a comment you'd like to make? Uh, well, I guess it's Would, would I do that now, make my comment now before my vote? I don't know how this works. Yes, if you all have additional comments, go ahead and make those now before we call the vote. Yes. So, so long as everyone's clear as to the uh, proposed resolution on the table. Right. So I guess, I guess my comment um, and why I don't think that I'm going to be supporting this, um, we have... We, <laughs> Someone can own 10 long-term rental properties, and we're okay with that. We're okay with that commercial endeavor, but someone who owns three STRs somehow is, um, that's incompatible, and that's, that's a money-making scheme that needs our attention. That seems out of balance to me. Um, you know, if I own 10 long-term rental properties, I'm making money. So why are we upset that someone who owns three short-term rentals is also making money? It doesn't affect our housing. Our housing is, uh, stock is less than one, is less than 1% of that housing stock. Um, I think it's going to create a financial hardship for people um, who operate multiple short-term rentals without incident. And I fear we're, we may be punishing uh, the whole for the actions of eight complaints from September, if I have that number correct. Eight. And so now anyone who has, because we didn't have you know an ordinance, I like to call it the wild, wild west, they purchased furniture, they purchased homes, they are fixing up homes. And now we're saying sorry. And, you know, we listen to people talk about, you know, older folks talking about their future finances being tied to this activity. And we are saying no. Um, in a sense, we are determining the level of risk that we think is appropriate for someone to take. Not everybody wants to take the risk of long-term rentals. That comes with a whole other um, set of challenges that maybe they, they don't want to take. And I think they should be allowed to make those decisions. Um, so um, I think that's it. I mean, I, I think that's, it feels like an overstep to me. That's all, thank you. So will you be supporting the ordinance? I will not. Commissioner Carter. Well, I will be supporting the ordinance. Uh, nobody seems to like it, so it must be a good ordinance. <laughs> um, no, I think the staff has done what they were directed to do by council, and I think uh, the ordinance isn't perfect. It can get better. I think we've given some suggestions to council as to how it may get better, but I think it's up to the council to make that determination. And I think uh, our, our uh, discussion was good and, and we'll give some additional direction to council. So I'll be supporting uh, moving the ordinance forward. Thank you, Commissioner Duggan. I'm also in support of the ordinance. I think um, even though long-term renting can have challenges, long-term renters can add to a community just as homeowners can in a way that short-term rental occupants will not. Um, I think also some of the people that came and spoke to us tonight who are surrounded by short-term rentals mentioned that part of their discomfort is the level of activity of all the, the house cleaners, uh, the vans picking up people, not necessarily just an outside party, not just a disruption from that. 
And I think that a lot of that would go away if we um, adopt the ordinance as we've sort of made our small changes to it. So I'm in favor of the ordinance. Thank you. Mr. Sisko? Yes, I'm also in favor of the ordinance, and um, I know we're required to make the uh, zoning code findings, which I can make, and I'll be supporting the ordinance. I think it's, you know, so much work has gone into this, and really, I always feel kudos to our code enforcement department. You guys are amazing, and um, in, in a lot of ways, um, because of the, the enforcement issues in this ordinance, um, the short-term rental uh, neighbors are better off than maybe someone like me who has <laughs> issues with my long-term neighbors and has code enforcement issues. They'll get treated faster, et cetera. So I, I think that's a plus as well. Thank you. Vice Chair Peterson. Uh, so I also, like uh, Commissioner Sanders, do not support this ordinance uh, for, for different reasons, as was discussed. I think uh, having, continuing to have non-hosted short-term rentals in the city is, is a mistake. I think there's a meaningful difference between short and long-term rentals in terms of the, the relationships they build with the neighbors, the quality of the neighborhood, things like speeding, parking, trash, respect for your neighbors. I mean, I, I think there can be bad long-term neighbors, certainly, but even if you've got a long-term neighbor uh, that's bad, they're probably not throwing a rager every weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and if they are, you can maybe at least build the relationship with them. It's, it's the same person that you're seeing. So I think there is a meaningful difference, and I think um, non-hosted invites bad behavior. Um, and, and I'm also a little skeptical of, of the financial argument. I mean, it, we're talking about people with at least one house and often more than one house in one of the most expensive property markets in the, in the country. Um, the restriction is not uh, anything other than you, you cannot rent it for shorter than 30 days. You can still rent it um, or you can sell it. Uh, so I, I I, I think the, the public comments on that were, were pushing that a, a bit from my perspective. But again, with all that said, it's, it's hard for me to make the findings that are necessary um, with the inclusion of the non-hosted rentals because I, I don't think it um, is in line with the general plan or the uh, zoning code. Thank you. Well, I will be supporting the uh, ordinance. It's not perfect. Um, but uh, I think it is an improvement, and uh, at some point when it gets to council, if they decide they wanted major changes, then they would direct staff and we'd see this back again. So, uh, but for this, for what uh, you were directed to do, I think uh, this is a good outcome, so I will be supporting it. Vote. Commissioner Carter? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Sisko? Aye. Commissioner Duggan? Aye. Commissioner Sanders? No. Vice Chair Peterson? No. Chair Weeks? Aye. So that passes with four ayes and two noes. And with that, I think uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you all.